Good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This afternoon, we're going to take up H-687 and our first witness is Charlie Baker. Good afternoon, Chair Sheldon and members of the committee. Thank you for uh, allowing me to testify this afternoon. <laughs> provided a few pages of comments. So, uh, we're trying to get more specific and try to uh, kind of instructive in specific sections of the bill. Um, I lost, I can't remember how many comments we specifically have, but um, generally we just also want to say thank you for your work on uh, addressing the housing crisis, environmental protection, and strengthening the processes to better support implementation of plans municipally and regionally. Specific comments, if you're ready, and I can pause however you want to run it under chair if you want to pause after each one, um, but uh, just starting off section two, page two. Um, Give us one second to pull up. It's hard to read. Okay, can I blow this up a little bit? Well, we have it here, so. One minute. We are well, yeah. Yes, these are related to draft two. Yes, so I was looking at the draft from last week. Apologies, I don't know if there's a new one. Just came. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so page two, section two, uh, we recommend striking the capability and development plan language there. Uh, page. Uh, Page two. So he's got written testimony with that outline. Section two, page two. Um, section five on page nine. Is it, is it easy if I start off with the page number first? And also, if you can just say why. Uh, why? Uh, because <laughs> because um, at least from our view, uh, we see the, uh, the regional planning process, the regional plans replacing the, the hoped for capability and development plan that's never been effectuated, right? Um, and then, um, yeah, Representative Sibelia has a question. <clears throat> so, should we maybe just correct that? Are, are we correct? Are we proposing changes to kind of identify that the regional plans are that? Plan? Yeah, in other sections as we go further down. Yeah. There was just kind of a reference to this capability and development plan in this. For a section. So just going straight through the, the draft bill. Um, the section five on page nine, um, and this is, um, there's a sentence in there about doing rules, rulemaking for regional plans. Um, and this is just our position at the moment is that we're hoping to avoid that and just rely on guidance from the ERB. Um, and then there's more language in section six um, around this. Um, um, yeah, we might go to why, but. Yeah. Go ahead, Representative Sibili. Yeah, um, one of the issues that I'm really concerned about is consistency. Yes. Um, and so I do wonder about why with this. And I think yeah. it's the same thing we have been saying that we'd like to see more specific language in statute rather than um, waiting for rulemaking. So I think that's, and that's really, and maybe that's just the way that we're used to functioning. We, all of our regional uh, plans are just come from statute, yeah. statutory direction about what we're supposed to do, and that's how we're used to carrying things out. Um, just where our minds are at the moment. Uh, so having said that, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm really thinking about this. Um, let me, yeah. let me kind of keep walking through it because there's a lot of pieces here, um, if I could. Six pages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I mean, I think what you're saying is they're related to further suggestions. Yeah, we're creating a system that works. Um, and, a, and this is kind of the broad stroke thing that came out of the three studies as they work together, right? There's regional planning, we're doing planning, there's designations, providing some uh, financial incentives for uh, these smart growth areas. And then we have the regulatory system at with Act 250, both increasing jurisdiction in rural resource areas and decreasing jurisdiction in areas where we want to see growth, right? So we're trying to tie all that together um, with this. And that's really in this next section here, um, page 13, section six, we're trying to get really um, specific about, we see the ERB having three specific roles um, related to what I just mentioned. One is reviewing applications for the designated plan growth area. So that's that full exemption area um, and producing guidelines uh, for municipalities seeking that designation. 
some of that language is already there. I think this is just a <clears throat> modification there. And then two things that are not in the current draft. Um, one is reviewing requests from RPCs for approval of regional plans pursuant to the criteria that's in 24, 48, 43, 48A. That's the elements of a regional plan section. Um, again, produce, the uh, board can produce guidelines for RPCs uh, for that. And then, um, and then this is kind of the a key concept here. And I think this is a point where we've been struggling uh, with clarity is that in addition to just approving our regional plan, we're kind of envisioning a second layer of approval of really specifically looking at the places that we designate on our map that would be where the downtown, the center planning area, the neighborhood area, and that rural conservation area, uh, what you've been calling the critical resource area, that those get specific review um, and, and maybe there's some um, uh, direction and statute about what the board is reviewing against, um, that they're reviewing that as a separate decision. Um, and again, we have a reference, this is going back to the designation section of um, this um, <coughs> D805. Now I'm concerned, do you have all the designation language? Because I'm realizing that some of this, I was also looking at S308. Sorry, this has been quite challenging on our side to be reviewing three bills yeah, at the same time. It wasn't intended to happen that way. Yes. Um, we have it and we are gonna, I think, have it in our next draft. So this may be referring to a section that's in S308, which is the designation. Um, and uh, again, we're trying to make that linkage that the rural conservation area is really defined by how you define critical resource area in section 6001 of title 10. Uh, and again, that there may be guidance um, and I guess that last sentence says it's to be done concurrently with the regional plan review, but there is a separate decision point there. And, um, and we'll talk later on with, we think that's important because that's where people's um, like the jurisdictional decisions getting made, right? Either brought into Act 250 or not. Um, and that's also where we're likely to, to see appeals um, on that uh, Act 250 jurisdictional position. Oh, sorry, I'm planting some more thoughts here than, <laughs> but um, yeah, we um, in the uh, this is Bongar, I guess. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, why you... would you do it as a two step? Why wouldn't when you submit the future land use map, why wouldn't you have to the best of your ability brought these through, identified them, and had it all be one process? We are thinking it's one process, but we're trying to be clear that we think there's two decisions going on because there's some specific criteria around these jurisdictional decisions, what's in tier one and tier three to use that lexicon. But there's also, there's a lot of language in the regional planning part of statute that has a lot more topics and things that we're supposed to address that, that are not necessarily related to Act 250 jurisdiction, <coughs> maybe directly related. So there's kind of a, are we complying with the regional plan section of statute? And are we um, are we complying with what's required in this jurisdictional decision making about tier one and tier three? What would happen? Not uh, maybe this isn't the time to beat this horse. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, what would happen if the first level of the plan was approved and then they said no, you haven't done a good job with the critical resource areas? Yeah. Would the rest of it go forward, and what would then be the impetus to get that part done? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Probably needs some clarity on that. You know, it was some savings provisions or something. Yeah, so um, that is definitely something to look at. Thank you. Um, not sure if I was going to add more. Was there a more question about that? And I think um, I know I was going to just give you an analogy. Um, we've talked about the energy planning process that we've gone through here before. This is analogous to um, when we review municipal plans, if they ask for, if a town comes to the regional planning commission and asks for approval of their town plan, we're now getting this two decisions. They're asking for approval of the town plan, but then they're, they're also, they can ask for um, a determination of energy compliance for their energy plan. So if a municipality does an enhanced energy plan. So we've been kind of experiencing this kind of like dual decisions um, where we're dealing with municipal plans right now. 
So that's kind of where this concept kind of came from of, um, and it also would be a little cleaner because we think there may not be um, real reasons to appeal the regional plan, but there are reasons to appeal these jurisdictional maps. Uh, so just want to kind of be clear on that. Representative Sibelia. I would just note that I find that to be kind of a curious concept. Yeah. Which? That uh, the plan and the maps are not connected. Uh, they are absolutely connected. That the plan could move forward even though the maps were not correct. Um, I think in the case that Representative Bongars brought up, like if, if there was some um, <clears throat> ERB said, oh, you didn't, you didn't do the map, you didn't follow the direction from the legislature or the ERB properly, you know, go back and redo it and bring it back for approval. They do stay connected. It's just um, the decision points at the ERB is being really specific about them. I think there are two decisions there. And there's two sections of statute that we're talking about compliance with. There's kind of this um, Act 250 section of statute for jurisdictional purposes, and there's a regional planning section of statute that has, you know, 12 elements of what we're supposed to include in our regional plans. No, I just, I, I mean, I have so many questions. But, but. Okay. Um, and related to um, the, I think the first comment, there's, um, this is just a little cleanup from our view as we're, we were kind of looking at the statutory section. There's multiple sections about the capability and development plan uh, starting at uh, 106042. So we're suggesting making it clear that the board to review and approve regional plans rather than the capability and development plan and but the, all the purposes for doing that remain the same. Um, and then there's there was process set up around those capability and development plan that doesn't seem wouldn't if we move to this new model wouldn't seem necessary. So that's a suggestion there. Um, number five, um, section 23. This is uh, where we get into the language about um, Act 250 jurisdiction, uh, particularly what's on the, uh, there's two, two major things here. Um, one is the road rule. Um, we support some version of the 2000 foot uh, road rules recommended in the NRB report. Um, and then uh, this is not a, a new comment necessarily, but just uh, we're a little bit concerned as we you know, follow up from our last testimony last week about the amount of land that might be jurisdictional based on at least what was in the draft last week of the critical resource area. Carly, uh, I um, asked members offline to put on their ecology hat yeah. over the weekend and think about um, what are the resources critical to Vermont's future and adaptation to climate change and resilience. Um, separate from jurisdiction, um, just yeah. scientifically, what, what does that mean? So if we were to separate them, um, but make it more of a criteria, I guess I'd put that out there and I'd like folks to think about that as a different way of looking at them. Because I think there's a, been a disconnect around the conversations of like, what do they mean? You know, what, what does it mean? And we're gonna have a conversation this week about what is the critical resource area? And is it really just those very small areas of irreplaceable natural communities or which, which may be already protected um, or is it a resilient landscape that's functional to the best of the abilities of our landscape to assisting Vermonters in addressing climate change? So I think that's a big picture question we're gonna have to work out but I do ask folks to think about it in both ways. <laughs> think about it, you know, separate from how we then use the information. That, that, is, <laughs> that is a tough challenge here. Um, uh, number six, um, this was just, um, this was getting into uh, adding a sentence to, to what you had as a definition of critical resource area. And again, we're, starting from this assumption that that is the tier three jurisdictional definition. Um, so, and you'll note that we didn't get into exactly what's in there, but just trying to be clear that this definition is what we'll use 
by the RPCs to define that rural conservation and future land use. So uh, I noted last week, like there was some language that I don't know, may have come from, I can't remember where it came from that we had in, in, um, in our definitions in the regional planning section that was different than what you had in Title 10. And so we're just trying to say, whatever you put in Title 10, what we'll use in our regional plans. Uh, so we're just trying to, again, link up and make consistent uh, things. Um, number seven, uh, this is a, well, a minor change in striking a couple words or replacing a couple words, but we, we just uh, think it's important to be clear that a designated planned growth area is, is more than just the core of the municipality. I think we were a little bit concerned that it would get confused with the center designation. Um, and you know, we've been talking this entire time about also the residential areas outside of those designated centers. Um, and so, um, so, and also that there's another a significant idea for your consideration here, which is that we are hoping that the tier 1B areas get kind of automatically approved once those maps are approved by the NRB, or sorry, ERB, um, so that uh, that approval there kind of gets that, that first layer of designation for the 1B areas uh, and tier 3 happen at that map approval uh, stage Whereas for 1A, that highest level of exemption, a municipality would come back to the ERB with a separate application to get that level of exemption. Then in Bondar. So with 1B, we want to make it easy. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to be as inclusive. Yep. But we also are looking at requirements that those towns have yes. some things in place. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to that. And so the way I've been thinking about this, which maybe it's just me, um, is that with both 1A and 1B, you would designate the areas that are eligible for consideration. And then they would, based on checking boxes, then apply. Um, so and the idea isn't to make it hard, it's just going to put up those boxes. Because there are a lot of areas, let's just take 1B, if you look across a regional and map, my guess is we will find that the, I'll use the term circles, where those towns may be, there may be a lot of them, but only half of them would have what it takes to become a 1B town. Yep. And so what you're saying is confer automatic jurisdiction on all of those. If they meet those standards. So you're saying, so they would have a different kind of circle if they were, if they, if it would, because some of those towns will be striving, for instance, to get there to become a one B town. So that though that circle would be a different color or something, those towns that don't this this might make sense here, but right. So those these are just some of those things we're gonna have to really get specific about. Yeah. So got other language later on here right. trying to tie that together. Right. Our thought is that that um those those standards for one B. Uh, maybe basic enough that we can determine that with the municipalities when we're putting our maps together. And that <clears throat> shouldn't, it doesn't, at this point anyway, what we've seen of the standards that have been discussed doesn't seem complicated enough to make it a separate application process. Um, and, and by the way, the way, at least again, I'm thinking about it is that the way with Chris Cochran sitting in that chair yeah. talking about that those, that would be automatically conferred on it's kind of all of the let's say 1B. Yeah, that's, and this is... That's, so this is different. This is just the regulatory review you're talking about because... No, that's this not true. We have to parse it. This is so the that's the 1B area. That's our, like, that's that neighborhood designation area that has been talked about in the designations study would be the 1B area. They automatically starts qualifying for some basic level of benefits. They probably have different requirements because I think it's, if Chris is sitting there, He'd be thinking that almost all of those circles would automatically be eligible for the benefits that his shop would confer. <laughs> and we're thinking about the regulatory relief portion. So we have to think of just Yeah, and we're trying to think about it all together. Other, other, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, I just um, want to note that um, I don't have a good grasp on where we are or the conversation that's taking place right now. So. Just want to note that. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you're right. I'm layering a lot of stuff on 
um, and, and maybe with some assumptions. So let me know if I do need to back up or maybe we're having a conversation that isn't uh, fully uh, accessible to everyone. But so Madam Chair, I trust your judgment. Should I back up a little bit just to talk about kind of the, the base concept? Would that be helpful? It would be helpful to the vice chair and others, sure. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to summarize <laughs> this concept in a couple minutes. Um, so as we talk about our towns, um, and I'm gonna go kind of maybe from rural to urban. Um, so, if, and I'm gonna try to mash together what I understand is kind of the recommendation coming out. They came out of all three of these studies, if you put them together and how they work together. Tier three, critical resource area is new jurisdiction for Act 250. Right, uh, tier two, some of the studies I think was largely, you know, mostly leave alone, maybe some road rule, maybe some other jurisdictional threshold that you talked about here. But tier two was largely talked about leave it, that's the, we're not talking about a lot of policy change there. Then we go into the tier one B, um, and this is, this is the area outside the village centers. Let me talk about a village, small town, they got a village, they got a little center designation in the middle, but they have some neighborhood around it. Um, that's, and they meet some basic standards, uh, which now that I'm talking about, I forgot what they are, but um, we'll, we'll get into that. But the tier one B, they, they have done some level of planning, uh, zoning, and they have some bit of infrastructure that would qualify them both for, um, and I think there's been two parts to represent Bogart's point earlier, that have been talked about in terms of benefits. They start qualifying for the neighborhood benefits under the designation program, and they might get some limited Act 250 relief so that we're uh, uh, encouraging housing in towns all across the state. Um, and so I've been kind of referring to this, as, that was kind of um, the, the idea to be as inclusive as possible, make it low barrier, but uh, provide towns all across the state the ability to at least achieve that one B in where they want to grow. Um, and that's, you know, consistent with their plans, bylaws. So that's one B, but uh, Representative Bongart, you're right. There's kind of two things going on. There's a little change in, in jurisdiction for Act 250. And there's some other benefits that uh, Chris Cochran has probably talked more in detail. And then, and that we see those, those map layers could be done and the criteria we're hoping that the RPCs understand clearly enough from statute and or rulemaking that follows that we can map those areas and bring them to the ERB. We're hoping the downtown, um, I think our, you'll see further on here that the downtown board weighs in um, and has comments that they provide to the ERB so that all three parties are connected in those decisions. Um, and then the, the final uh, level is the tier 1A, that full exemption from Act 250 with the highest amount of uh, requirements for a municipality to meet. Um, and those are, you know, our towns with the largest capacity and the most ability are gonna be able to get to tier 1A. Um, so that's the basic concept. Does that help Representative Sebelia? Okay. Thank you for doing that. So that's the best for, all right, nobody laughed me out of the room. Okay. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, comment number eight. Um, this is, now we're getting into the criteria uh, or the requirements for tier 1A. Um, and we're just, particularly in the urban form requirement, are suggesting some more flexibility. Um, I have a little bit of concern with the historic preservation and wildlife habitat bylaw requirements. Um, and would like to kind of hear from municipalities a little bit more about that. Um, and, um, and, in, in particular, on those two requirements, uh, we'd like to think about whether new bylaws are required or maybe there's an option for a municipality to, de to demonstrate some other method of protecting those resources. Um, so anyway, that's not a fully baked thought, but just a flag at the moment. Um, and the urban form, um, I think this is mostly a concern uh, about whether they can really how limited this would be if we require six stories. And so we're suggesting three stories uh, in a portion of the area, mm -hmm. kind of recognizing, you know, it's not gonna be uh, flat, you know, wherever the tier 1A would be, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have the same zoning throughout that entire area. So, you know, you, you guess oriented us to how the 
three different um, pieces of this puzzle are kind of currently moving towards fitting together. Yeah. And um, this language, I think, in in your eight comment, all of it, well, not the wildlife, but the other two, um, maybe the wildlife, and it comes from the downtown designation process. Okay. And I guess what I'm wondering about is there, if we um, just kind of being aware of how, like, what is our expectation in the growth areas around historic preservation and urban forum bylaws? And do they need to be linked or do they stay part of more of the downtown board's area of interest? And if so, how, right? Like, I'm not sure how they're linked now, but I think I know that I think that the historic is surely part of the downtown. Yes. Um, and I'm going to surmise that the urban form bylaws are part of that as well. So um, check in. Yeah, that that. Would be true. And um, I guess I'm not seeing that this thought. This is about tier 1A as opposed to the downtown. I know. So, right. Uh, yeah, we're. Think those pulled over would... from downtown designation is my point. Yeah, but we also think that downtown criteria is likely to stay there. So we were not trying to take this out of the downtown criteria. So there's there's still that, um, and that's in a different section of statute, right? Where the designation section of statute. So we're not we're not suggesting taking it away from the downtown section. It's good to know. So this may be conflated a little bit. Yeah, because sorry, I guess I didn't finish my uh, introduction, because there are still the center designations that we anticipate both for Village Center and downtown still remaining. Uh, you know, the downtowns definitely have a higher bar, you know, not just uh, historic preservation, but they have to have a Main Street program. That's a lot of uh, other things that the downtown has to do to get those that highest level of downtown designation. Uh, so, yeah, we were not trying to undermine that part. Uh, this is more about the Act 250 jurisdiction in, in Tier 1A. Um, Oops, just for longer. what it's, but, uh, you know, he can say it himself, but I <clears throat> raised the same issue with Chris Cockrell, frankly, and, and he suggested, and I, this makes sense to me, that we, that we could say urban form bylaws or design review or historic preservation bylaws. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not, you're not requiring the urban form bylaws. They're a tool. They're one of many, and towns can choose what they want. So this. I've made that note to myself, but that's something you might want to think about. It's just as long as you're doing one of those. Yeah. And as you're thinking about that, it just, I think this distinction between tier 1A and the downtown, we need to think through that a little bit more because in our, those real downtown areas, um, those urban design uh, standards make more sense. I don't know if they should apply to the entire 1A area, you know, when we get into the residential neighborhoods surrounding, right? Uh, so that's just something I think need to think through a little bit more. But yeah, good point. They need to be. Right. I think it's a tool model requirement. Yeah. Um, section twenty four. Sorry, comment nine. Julia, really, did you have some? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, urban form bylaws are. Uh, I, th I think in the discussion, there's some different flavors. There's sometimes they have a. Uh, there's uh, a downtown design. Uh, standards. Sorry, I'm like losing the words. I haven't thought about this in a little while. Um, but there's some, some, a lot of our, well, all the towns that have downtowns have some sort of uh, design review in their downtowns. Um, but then there's been more recently, there's been form based codes where they're kind of uh, articulating the form they want uh, rather than just a use zoning. I'm sorry, now I'm really going into planner speak and you guys need to stop me quickly. But um, so there's just some different forms of uh, bylaws that municipalities are using to uh, guide the design of development, particularly in the most urban downtowns. It can also be a form of pre-approval to make it easier to get. So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of the form-based code, absolutely right. Um, just, I would just say generally. So for me, anyway, when thinking about if we were to pass this type of historic legislation, my need to be able to explain it to my neighbors. And I'm not a land use planner, I'm a waitress who's focused on telecommunications and energy policy in the legislature. 
So I really need it at the sixth grade level. We are um, working on something to try to produce a summary document on the side too. So uh, totally understand that. I mean, you can see me struggling is getting complicated, a uh, graphic, I appreciate things your, like that. I appreciate you. Your explanations are helpful, Charlie. So I'd like more of them, less presumption of knowledge. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is um, in section 24. This is just, I think, just uh, trying to note that um, that it's not just, and again, we're trying to make this distinguishing this to the regional plan and the plan growth area. This maybe should say tier three. Also, I can't remember the context of this language. And again, deleting the tier one B, which uh, we're hoping doesn't have to happen with this process. Um, section 24, and I think this is getting into um, <clears throat> municipality coming forward with their tier one application. The, uh, the pre-application meeting should be uh, not just with the RPC staff, but with the municipality. Um, uh, we think uh, section C3 um, could just as easily be incorporated into a recommendation letter from the RPC without a, a lot of extra process. Um, same with four. What is C3? I don't know. What is it now? Page 50. So, um, this is about the RPC establishing a procedure for an application by the municipality um, that involves uh, comments from all the parties. Um, and you know, I think not, not uh, the concept is right. Like we need to be all on the same page. It's just whether we need a whole, do we need that extra paperwork? It's really all we're asking. Nine above where you strike the number two, um, are you putting those requirements back in somewhere else? No, this is consistent with our notion that uh, we wouldn't need a separate application process for tier 1B. No, but they have to show those A, E, I, J, K, those are things they have oh, yeah, to show, no. like they have to have bylaws, they have to have. Yeah. Yes, we do have them in another section. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and yeah, and then in, in that last paragraph there, we're just saying the Regional Planning Commission may not need to be really involved in that last section, that the RPC can um, issue the notice, or sorry, the municipality can issue the notice on their own. Um, and on um, comment 11, page 55, section 27, uh, and this is, this is not statutory language, but we're thinking that there needs to be some reference to um, 6032 and Again, the, the tier one plan growth areas in the designation section of statute. And apologies, I don't know, 5805 and 5806, those are coming from S308 again. So I don't know if that made it into this version of, or not. Uh, it's, it's not in 2.2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what? I'll we'll check out the Office of Legislative Council. 50. Uh, to create the new designation program, 308 establishes a new chapter in Title 24, and that's where the 5800 statutes are. So that's what he's cross referencing. So if you bring that language into your next draft, those numbers will be there. Thank you for that. Sorry, I was... So re rewriting the designation chapter to reflect the designation report would involve a new chapter of statute in the 5800s. Okay, um, uh, comment 12, um, uh, geez, I need to look at this. I was trying to be short in my comments, but I lost some context here. Um, page 57, um, oh, there's a, yeah, this par the paragraph at the end here, near the bottom of page 57, uh, subsection H, um, where and it was kind of, it was a little interesting to read. We're not sure if it's trying to stand alone or if it's modifying all the stuff that happens in G. Um, so it was just kind of just trying to get some clarity there. Um, and particularly around, this is about uh, previous Act 250 permits. And so G kind of had a lot about how to handle it. And then H, I wasn't sure if it was trying to say something completely different or how it relates to H or G. 
uh, so suggesting that maybe it says as may be modified in accordance with the previous section. That makes sense. G is long. Um, page 63. Sorry, now I'm going to start going through the bill. Um, section 30. Um, and this is about uh, 60, section 30, page 3. Oh, uh, this is, um, we proposed, so this is, this is us not being, um, we're, we're in the right place. <laughs> we propose language that actually gets picked up multiple times down later um, in this draft about that maybe with the absence of Act 250, maybe RPCs um, would want to have some more direct role in the municipal permit process if the permit triggered the RPC's definition of significant regional impact. <clears throat> We're now not sure that we want that we need to do that. Um, and so I, I guess this is our way of saying, you know, we could go either way on that. Um, if, if this doesn't seem important, we're fine losing it. Um, if it does seem important, it's, it can stay too. But uh, this is this notion about RPCs having party status and municipal permits is mentioned multiple times. If you get into those transportation related sections, I think you looked at last week. Uh, and when we contemplate these exemptions to Act 250, we certainly hear from folks who think that's important. To, the large, some some level of definition of what is a project of regional significance, and um, you know that that they in many instances appreciate some additional review on those projects. Okay, then I will skip over those subsequent comments where I where I follow up on this. I'm yeah. I mean, I just I think. Yeah. That's, was I noticed when you put it in there? I thought that was the that's a piece for the committee to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, section uh, thirty-two. Um, okay, now we're getting into the um, sections of statute around the regional planning process, um, and um, we had language um, and we suggested and I think this is following up on some conversation in this committee um, and a, a new sentence to say that um, the public engagement efforts to follow guidance develop to provide meaningful participation and address environmental justice um, and I think I saw some uh, question in the committee like what's the connection to environmental justice here um, a couple of years ago uh, you passed environmental justice law um, a big focus of that was how state agencies engage with the public uh, and in particular um, underrepresented communities. Um, so we've been kind of uh, watching that and waiting for that, but we also figured one of the requirements was for, I think it was for a &R to come out with some guidance about how to do good public engagement um, that involves all of the community. So this was our note to say, hey, we probably should be following that guidance that comes out of that process. Um, the next uh, one um, I'm gonna skip over because that's a, the substantial uh, regional impact uh, comment again. Uh, all right, here's, this is a, a bigger new idea on uh, number 16. And, and, and this is, uh, some have been having some conversation um, with others about, you know, how how do we address appeals? Um, you know, should, how do, where where do these maps get appealed? How do they get appealed? Um, we need some sort of process. Uh, we're suggesting that um, if a party has participated in the regional planning process, so we want them to participate in our process. You know, we, we're required by statute to have two public hearings on our regional plan, like participate in that process. Um, and, but if they're not satisfied with how, particularly the maps, I think that we're really, we're talking about maps turned out, um, then we're suggesting that, that, uh, that appeal be brought to the ERB at the same time that the ERB is reviewing a regional plan. So they can kind of hear, uh, here's what the RPC did. And there's an aggrieved party that isn't satisfied with that result. The ERB can kind of consider that at the same same time and try to resolve that dispute at that level. So 
we were kind of think of this as more appeal to regional plan to the ERB if you're not happy with where the regional planning commission ended up. Um, you know, the alternative that's getting talked about is just bring it to the ERB, the ERB makes a decision, and then it goes to the Supreme Court or some other higher court. Um, so this is just our way of trying to encourage people to participate in the regional planning process. You know, don't don't sandbag, like don't tell us you have a, don't have an issue and then tell us at the ERB you have an issue. You gotta let us know at the regional planning stage, but also just um, you know, timing and resources of trying trying to use the layers of appeal process. But so this is an idea for your consideration. Um, Thanks, Madam Chair. Can you scroll up so I can see oh. what you were thinking of um, proposing that this? It's oh. an interesting page sixteen nine. Yeah, sorry. It's an interesting. I mean, I I can imagine the benefit of having you know, the ERB say, okay, this is the plan and here's an appeal to that. I can also imagine situations in which like that timing doesn't quite align and just the need to make sure um, that everyone knows, uh, you know, to what the vice chair has been mentioning mm -hmm. about public outreach, like everyone knows what the conversations are and what people are talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And, um, and just to be clear, there is no approval process right now for regional plants, right? So this is, you know, uh, and we are certainly supporting, you know, that new level of accountability and consistency um, in this process. And it's really, yeah, appeals need to get addressed somehow. This was just one alternative idea from just doing a straight court shot from the ERP. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, and uh, I just plant a flag here. I, I do appreciate seeing this language to think about uh, plant a flag here on the other issue that I continue to be concerned about, which is uh, ability to appeal in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the other thing I think was, thanks for saying that actually, because that was kind of unspoken in our heads here. I'm maybe sure written it down is, is, you know, is the ERB a friendlier place to go to get that grievance aired than going to the Supreme Court? Uh, you know, maybe that's something that's part of the considerations. Help me understand the timing of this, though. I'm like, uh, so the ERB would also be approving these plans. So it's like, I guess, within 15 day days of plan adoption. So Not that, yeah. the RPC adopts the plan, but hasn't taken it to the ERB. And this person wants to appeal it. Or when does that happen? Or what about plans? Are we talking about maps? You said, um, maps, but it says plans here. Yeah. Um, so we are talking, um, all right. So in, in paragraph three here, we're talking about appeal. It's limited to the question of whether the regional plan is consistent with the elements, um, that the enhanced energy, um, that is a good clarification. Thank you. That needs some more work. And our regional plans have, in your experience, have they ever been appealed? To the Supreme Court or to the ER, to the Environmental Court, I guess is where it would go now. There is no reason to do that, my knowledge. No, there's no uh, you know, formal process beyond the board itself, beyond the Regional Planning Commission itself approving it. Um, so, I'm not aware that anything like that is. So, Charlie, I, I'm just thinking about the map time that you and others are putting into thinking about this and who you report to and where the funding is coming for that. But then also, and feeling some gratitude for your time here, uh, but also where is the consensus happening amongst the RPCs for this language to be brought in front of us? So have they all seen it? Have they all signed off on it? This is a new concept. I've reviewed it with Catherine and Peter. We have not shopped it around. And frankly, I will, this is an area of, you know, not all the RPC boards certainly want the RPC, the regional plan, you know, necessarily to have a state level approval or appeal process. Good to know. Yeah. So, I mean, I, to, if I can name names, I think if you ask the Lamoille County, Planning Commission, or maybe even the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, I do not think they are supportive of uh, 
this much state involvement on the regional plan. NVDA? Excuse me? NVDA? I haven't had that specific conversation with David, so I don't know the answer to that. Those are the, those are the two RPCs. Um, so as I'm trying to share information and get feedback, those are the two that I've heard back from that specifically said their boards had some concerns. Alan Tchaikovsky. Can I, can I jump in and this whole thing? Because this is, this is interesting. It's almost, instead of a, an appeal, it's almost like an objection. Mm -hmm. We're trying to become a party. Mm -hmm. um, because an appeal is after a decision has been made. And I guess a decision will have been made because the RBC has decided to adopt. And so I guess the question is at what point does someone like object to, have to the decision being made? Is that happening at the public hearing? Is, is the meeting or is the hearing where the plan is adopted, is that a public hearing? Yeah, there's two public hearings. There's two. Yeah. So presumably like there's like an, an inter like an introductory sort of one and then one where the, the plan is adopted or is that like a third? The, it's typically, I think the second, after the second public hearing, more typically the, the regional planning commission will say, okay, we'll close the hearing. Now we'll vote, assuming there's no other issue that came up, right? Okay. Or they could delay and do that another hearing. Okay. So they will have had to raise their objection in one of those two public hearings. That was the idea. Okay. And then... So, so yeah, so there's a couple different points there that are sort of interesting. I think you all hit on that, but I was trying to parse it out. So, so yeah, so then going to the ERB would be an appeal and that person could be a party to the decision that the ERB is making on whether to approve the regional plan or not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for listening to that idea. Thank you for your help. Um, uh, and, and that was kind of a, a new idea, definitely, in, in a, and in the regional plan section of statute, by the way, right? Like, and I don't know, again, it may need to be also a duty of the ERB if that was to happen. So there's probably some more things that would have to happen in Title 10. Um, page uh, 69, sorry, um, section 32 of the bill, um, which uh, clarification about minor amendments. Um, and this is just a kind of a future land use area as opposed to just a designated area. Uh, pages 73 and 75. Um, oh, this is um, in the elements of the regional plan. We've noticed that they're uh, kind of caught maybe a little late, but um, there were a couple of sections that also had to do with natural resources that were standing alone. This, this is just proposing to bring them into the natural resource element that we're proposing um, on page 73, I think. Um, uh, page 76, um, and here we're getting into some of the specific uh, requirements for tier 1B. So um, first we're kind of noting not all village centers have water sewer, like now that there's been a lot of, we have 247 designated village centers, I think now, not all of them have water, sewer, or, or plans or bylaws. Uh, most of them have plans and bylaws, but not all have the infrastructure. So just uh, adding a sentence to the definition of village center, to, uh, clarify that. And um, then uh, planned growth area. Um, this was in the description, but not in the kind of meet these requirements. So just clarifying that they need to have municipal sewer and water uh, as defined in 4303 where there's a lot of definition there. Um, okay, and then the village areas, and this is uh, kind of following up on some conversation, and this is more about the tier 1B uh, specifically. Um, one, you know, we had kind of like, they could have water or sewer or bylaws. Um, this adding a clarifying sense if no sewers available, they must, they must have soils that are adequate for wastewater disposal. I think that came out of your conversation here. So suggesting that. 
Um, and then the two uh, requirements that we're talking about for 1B and represent Bongarts is getting back to our earlier conversation. Like what are the requirements for 1B? How are they articulated? And this is what we've understood the conversation to be. They have a plan uh, and bylaws that have been approved. Um, so the, the planning process is confirmed with 4350. That's when the town brings their plan to the RPC to approve the plan and the planning process. Um, and they have bylaws in accordance with those sections. Um, and then um, this is uh, the second requirement is about kind of the flood hazard river corridor situation. Um, and I think we pulled some language here that I think, I don't think it's in this title. I think maybe it's in title 10 uh, that in, or, or this area excludes those areas um, from the designation area. So, um, you know, I think we're kind of envisioning smaller towns. Um, they probably all have flood bylaws. Uh, I think every, every community in Vermont that has floodplain has adopted flood bylaws at this point. Um, the river core is much less adoption, right? Um, I don't know how many towns have actually adopted. Um, I think maybe there's 10 to 20. So it's a really low rate of adoption. Um, but we want to kind of give a, have, want to give a little bit of room, like they either adopt the bylaws or, or we stay out of that area uh, somehow. So those are the two major criteria we're thinking about for the 1B area. Uh, and I think that was consistent with earlier conversations also. Representative Sibelia, can I ask for a re-explanation of that just one more time? Of? Uh, that what the, what you're proposing for 1B. So if you don't have. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good place to start. Um, so if we look at, and actually, um, Kitty Gallagher from VNRC presented a good map in Senate Economic Development last week that is worth taking a look at. But, and I was uh, encouraged to see how many towns have planning, uh, have uh, plans and bylaws. So most of the state and uh, the vast majority of the state, I'm gonna say 90% of the towns have plans and bylaws. So we didn't think the first hurdle was too significant. Most towns can meet that. And then, and then the uh, the second layer was kind of keeping people out of harm's way. You know, how do we make sure that they've done the work or we're not approving an area, trying to encourage growth in a place where it shouldn't happen? So that was kind of the two basic criteria. Is that, is that helpful to answer your question? So you're not proposing to do anything related to river corridor bylaws here? Well, if they have that, that would qualify them. We're just trying to yeah. give an option that maybe they could just exclude that area. So we're not encouraging development in that area. And if they don't, would they be penalized? No. No, that, actually, that's, uh, thanks for asking that. I think one of the other concepts that uh, underlie these three studies was the idea of, um, and, and we've had a lot of encouragement that has gone on over the years of municipalities. Right? We've been encouraging them to do plans. We've been encouraging them to do zoning. We've been encouraging them to do river corridor bylaws. Um, and I think th a lot of this, all these studies kind of, and this whole process is, is uh, part of the foundation of it is that a community can move up. And we're trying to give some encouragement to move up the scale. And you'll see that even more in the designation part of what uh, Chris has been talking about for the designations to get that. But I think we've been thinking about the same way, like, you know, there may be a small village, Take a step, and you can get the next layer of uh, benefits, if you will, from taking the next step. Whether it's you know get, getting a town plan or bylaws done, or um, or going all the way to tier one A, you know, and doing all that work to get there. So it's been really about encouraging what the state is asking for. So, how do we identify flood hazards in fluvial erosion areas outside of flood hazard or hazard mitigation plans? Um, the, those are the NFIP maps. And the river corridors have been mapped by a &R. So you're So the municipality we all held to um, the federal and state standard regardless 
as to whether or not they the adopt their these bylaws. Yes. Yeah. Flood hazard maps. Is that my knowledge? Every town with floodplain has adopted the flood hazard bylaws. Um, the river corridor. Yeah, I think that's kind of the the area under debate in large extent. It's like how do we not encourage more people to build in that location, right? Where we know there's going to be or the chance of floods happening in the future. Um, and, you know, frankly, I'm having a little bit of deja vu because this is the same conversation we had in 2012 after Irene. Um, and we ended up with this voluntary river corridor program, which, you know, I'm not sure has accomplished as much as we hoped. So what is the point of the bylaws then in this um, um, recommendation? Why would anybody do bylaws? What would be the point? Uh, to to keep people from building in places that are likely to be flooded. But if they're going to be held to the state river corridor maps anyway, why would they do the bylaws? Um, so I'm trying that, to understand what the recommendation is. That is not the state of the law right now. They're sure. not held to river corridor maps right now unless a project's going through Act 250. That's what we're proposing, potentially. Um, yeah, we're proposing that the municipality either take some responsibility or just stay out of that or like map it out of their uh, area where they're trying to encourage growth. So will the municipalities, um, will the municipalities be able to override the state um, determinations of the river corridor? Um, you should probably talk to DEC in more detail. I think there is, you know, as a have been working with municipalities where they have done river corridors. They've <clears throat> been um, negotiating what works in that village. So they've been, you know, kind of like, uh, oh, this is built, you know, you're, you're already kind of armored here. We're not going to exclude that. So there's negotiation that happens with those river scientists um, and folks that they could tell you more detail about. That's my basic understanding of it. So that so I'm hearing that the bylaws, the purpose then of spending time on doing the bylaws may be if yeah. the town has made some choices about where we're going to defend and where we're going to retreat. I think that's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I'm, I think I'm near the end here. Um, this is, um, sorry, this is tying back the loop that I brought up much earlier in Title 10 about the critical resource area being the definition for our rural conservation area in our plans. This is just saying the same thing in the regional planning section that the rural conservation area is defined by the critical resource area in Title 10. Um, so this is may, just may. So this is just trying an equivalence between existing rural conservation areas and proposed tier three. Not existing. This is all perspective. So the future, the maps that are prepared after after whatever law is passed would follow this definition as you put in here. Um, okay, uh, sorry, comment 23 is again about that significant uh, regional impact. Um, and then the last comment is really about the designation part of drafting that has gone on uh, that we think yet yeah, to fully understand, you need to see that section or that part of uh, statute or proposed uh, statutory changes as well. That That is it. Uh, sorry for going over time. Thank you for all of your... I know that was a lot for you. Thank you for your patience and allowing me to have that time. Yeah. Um, Ellen. So, Charlie, in the language that in that came from you, in the regional plan approval process, there is reference to ACCD and state and mm. county board. Could you just, and I was confused about how those two were also interacting with the ERV. Could you just talk a little bit about how you saw the three of those things? Those yeah. Entities working together? And my recollection without looking at the language is that there was um, a two stage process suggested. So there's kind of a preliminary, like pre application review almost, like, okay. like kind of, hey, before we finish, uh, before we're heading to public hearing <laughs> as a regional planning commission, we'd like to make sure that we're in a good place. So could you guys, could those agencies take a look? So that's what that was about. And then I think there's a, a later, more formal, like 
please give us some formal comments um, or if you have any issues, let us know during the public hearing process. Okay. So their feedback would come before the ERB's review. Oh yeah, before okay. before we even go to public hearing. Okay. Update. So we wanted to make sure, we're trying to make sure we're complying with state law. Okay. So uh, we're trying to get some input at that stage. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. No, thank you. Um, and your continued work on it. Very helpful. Members, let's take five minutes and then we'll reconvene with our next set of witnesses. I'm going to reconvene the hearing and say that we're going to continue our testimony on 687 and Representative Clifford has just a, I would like to request that we get a, a fiscal note on 687. I think it might help us to have some good information as we as we go on. That's a good point. I think we're going to hear from VTrans some on that. So we might have a better sense of what we would ask for in that fiscal note. But I, yes, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, next up, we have Mike Miller. Welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the City of Montpelier. I've been in my position for about 10 years, and I've been a planner in Vermont for about 24. Um, so I don't, uh, I haven't been directly following this bit. So I kind of digest as much as I could last night on it and get myself as much up to speed uh, working very hard on trying to get um, some budget adjustment with our residents. So my plug-in mm -hmm. for them. Um, but um, I wish I'd seen more of Charlie's presentation. It would, I think it would have been uh, helpful to kind of get some of where the Regional Planning Commission's perspective is. Um, I'll just give a couple of big picture items. I have some notes and thoughts I had, depending on how things go, that I'll probably put together in something writing to get back to you. Um, but really, I'll leave a lot of this open to see what questions you have. I have a lot of experience in municipal planning, um, whether it's been Barry City, Montpelier, as a regional planning person working with a lot of smaller towns. I've worked with everyone from Belvedere to Burlington. So um, I have a lot of experience working at the municipal level. Big picture for Montpelier, we're kind of been, we've been looking at a lot of these issues, uh, two big Barriers to development, <clears throat> one being Act 250 with, a, with our downtown. So we were very happy to see the, the different proposals that kind of came out through the, through the reports this December and the various tiers, because we would really like to see uh, exemptions for our downtowns, uh, because our downtowns are, we're the compact settlement that protects the rural countryside. And when we have processes and procedures that make it harder to develop or impossible to develop, uh, it just pushes that pressure to develop the countryside out more. And I'll, people familiar with Montpelier know we have Country Club Road site. The city has bought a uh, old golf course that we're gonna try to redevelop. As we did our due diligence on that project, uh, much of the area in the lower part is actually prime ag soils and it's not legal for us to mitigate. We literally could put 250 housing units on sewer and water in that area, and we can't. So we're really uh, invested in this idea of if we get this area, and it should be, be applying to expand our growth center. The growth center stops at the edge of this property. We would be including one more property in our growth center, and our hope and expectation would be that we could then be exempt from Act 250 and not have to leave that area empty um, because it's prime ag soil. But the impact of not developing 250 housing units there, if that gets pushed to the countryside, that's 500 because you need, you don't have sewer and water in places like East Montpelier. So to put 250 housing units in a rural countryside, you're talking about many, many times larger of an area of impact. So not protecting a small area of prime ag soils in our sewer service area. Uh, really, it's, it's a disservice to not only getting the housing built, but it puts pressure back on the countryside where we frankly don't want to be putting that pressure on. So at the Act 250 exemption is a big piece for Montpelier. We, we think we do a very good job of regulating. Um, most projects don't have to go through Act 250 in Montpelier and projects 
by and large have been very good projects. So uh, that's our first big picture. Can you can I just yeah. ask a question? I'm why can't you mitigate for those ag soils? Uh, something about those particular soils that when we had our we had VHB and Weitenberg do their review of it, and they said that's going to be our issue is that we either have to avoid Act 250. Um, but if we end up in Act 250, that because these are primate soils, not statewide soils, uh, statewide soils, I guess you can pay a mitigation fee for it. The prime ag soils, you can't. And so we're kind of caught in a pickle where we can't, we, we would be willing to cut a check and say, Here, here's the check because we're going to put $50 million worth of housing in there. So we're okay writing a check, but we can't even write a check to get out of it. So I've never heard that before. Um, and is it floodplain? No, Country Club Road is, is up on a hill. Okay. Yes. Mike, I'm looking at the map. Uh, what, what are you calling the lower section? Is that down next to the river? Uh, no, no. So if you were, if you know where the John Deere dealership is on Country Club Road, mm -hmm. you're going up. So you go, got to go up the hill to get to there. And then right. you get up to the top and there is a clubhouse. Yeah. So right around right that clubhouse is where the prime ag soils are. <clears throat> so that, yep. Yeah. So that's our first, our first concern is just, um, we, we, we support the review of Act 250. Out. A little energy behind you that people are not necessarily agreeing with this interpretation, and we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But okay, I'm curious about your the advice you were given. And okay, following, I can certainly follow up with that, up on, that. On, on the reviews. Does our, does our legislative council or the council or the executive director for the NRB want to speak to this? I'm happy to briefly. Pete Gill, executive director of the Natural Resources Board. Um, I'll say uh, two things. That, um, one, I think there are, there is uh, flexibility and mitigation standards in, within the law now, and I'm happy to talk with the city of Montpelier and uh, address address that or talk to their concerns offline here too. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, because uh, we yeah, and like I said, we can we can address those, but it is it is certainly an issue that we've been we are definitely looking at, um, and as as a planner. We generally look at um, a lot of these uh, projects. We're trying to get uh, streamlined. I usually talk to councils and select boards about you know make things easy for what you want, make things hard for people for things you don't want. And right now we've got an easy to do uh, small project. And if you want to do a larger project like Country Club Road, it's going to get continually and continually harder. And we really want to try to go and if that project were in a countryside, obviously, yes, we should have Act 50 review. But within my designated downtown or within my growth center, we would argue we really would like to see those types of properties uh, exempt from Act 250 because it's going to expedite that process um, in getting those, pro those permits issued and moving those projects along. The second piece that I know you talk about in this bill are appeals and uh, that is our, our other concern in Montpelier. A lot, of, a lot of people think it's very hard to develop in Montpelier because of the zoning, and actually it's not. We actually do a very good job. We're very fast at issuing permits, and we uh, generally issue most permits that come into our office. So, um, But where things get hung up is if you're not an attorney, your wife or husband is an attorney, or your relative is an attorney, and everybody everybody threatens to sue. And that is a significant issue for Montpelier. Uh, there are at least, I can, I can easily name 20, project, uh, 20 uh, housing units that have been stopped. They never even went to environmental court because simply people knocked on the door and said, your project's never going to see the light of day. And they contacted us to go through and say, we're withdrawing our application. It doesn't make any sense to go forward. It's a real issue in Montpelier for, for that to happen. Why do you think that is? Because they know it works, um, to be honest. I think they- Just think people don't want new neighbors? Uh, sometimes, um, I, th I think it's just classic NIMBY, to be honest. I think there's just, they, they don't want new neighbors, even if they're nice projects. Um, I could think of uh, on Sibley Street, a 16 unit building that was gonna be really nice. It, was, it wasn't affordable housing, it was actually, you know, 
going to be nice buildings parking underneath. They were going to be looking at renting at $2,000 a month. And the neighbors basically came in and said, this isn't going to see the light of day. We're like, folks, this is really nice. It's a really nice, you know, 16 unit building. And, and that was it. But because there are enough attorneys, the developer dropped the idea. Um, and sometimes it's just to, you know, extort something out of them, you know, and if they're not willing to give that, well, if you give me this, then I won't appeal your project and they're not willing to give up whatever it was the other person wanted. So uh, we've had some of those cases. Representative Stevens. Thanks, I'm sure. So um, if, you know, say Montpelier gets here 1A or whatever the designation is and then is exempt, wouldn't that mean that just your office would have to deal with or <clears throat> bump up to the Supreme Court? I mean, it. Um, I guess it, having tier 1A would mean that the project developer wouldn't necessarily have to go to before a future ERB, um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily address that NIMBYism issue. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, so it's, I'll say for, for the process piece, for whether it goes to, to the ERB, I don't know necessarily what's the best solution to appeals. Uh, I'm just saying appeals are our issue. And what we would like to see is I recognize everybody has a due process right, and you need to have that ability. But we also need to have the ability to ferret out some way or expedite these appeal processes such that we can get them done faster. We can get rid of the ones that are just frivolous simply to the fact that I'm going to appeal this. I'm going to appeal it to the Supreme Court, and I'm just going to kill this. It's going to take four years to get done. And then with the Act 250, they get a second bite at the apple. Being out of Act 250 means they're only going to get a single bite at the apples. And we have people that have gone through the first round, get to Act 250, and they get appealed a second time. Um, and it just depends on how, how the timing goes. So the advantage of being out is, from an appeal standpoint, they only get one bite at the apple. Thanks. So uh, those are really, from a big picture, those were um, some of the, the, the thoughts that we have when we're, when we're looking at these Act 250 and these local municipal zoning bills. Those are kind of the two things that we're looking at um, to try to make sure we can kind of get these processes moving forward. Uh, I think... A lot of these communities that would qualify as a 1A, we do a very good job. Not our entire city is going to qualify as 1A. Our areas that are in the designated downtowns and the growth center would qualify for these exemptions. And these are areas that have very good reviews, uh, professional staff, uh, and uh, design review. You know, there are a lot of things we review that the uh, Act 250 would not review. So it's... It's a good process. Uh, I've, as I said, I've been doing this for for 15 years as a planning director and as a zoning administrator. And you know, when you've got the good rules in place, we can we can both protect the environment, protect the character, and promptly issue permits and let projects move forward as appropriate. Representative Sibelia has a question. Uh, Ms. Miller, thanks for your testimony today, and I apologize for coming in late. And hope that you did not cover this. I apologize if you did. So how many units of housing did you lose uh, this summer with the flooding? Uh, this summer, we did better than Barry. So we have 375 houses in or, or buildings in the floodplain. Probably 250 of them got damaged, some damage. Uh, we substantially damaged sent out letters to eight properties. Um, but there are probably a handful of others that did not get substantially damaged uh, from a legal standpoint because there is a historic exemption. So if you have a historic building, then even if you've got 150% damage, you're still not substantially damaged. So we have a number of buildings that were heavily damaged, but aren't don't qualify as substantially damaged. So I would say... <sighs> 
we don't have an exact number of displaced residents, but I know some of them are, we've got a number of them that are displaced. So um, probably looking at it, um, less than 20. That 350 units in the flood. We have 350 buildings. buildings. So some buildings have more than one unit in it. Some of them are commercial and don't have any dwelling units in it. What does the city have? Um, does the city have any planning around um, moving um, housing or housing units out of the uh, that the flood area or, or <clears throat> protecting? Uh, is that something that the town is thinking about? Yeah, the city's um, city. approach to to the to resiliency is really to start working more aggressively on um, elevating buildings rather than moving buildings uh, or moving out. We're not going to be abandoning our floodplain because that is our entire grand list. That is all of our employment. That is most of the capital complex. That is, <laughs> it's a lot. So, um, but what we do know is uh, since 2018, we've had rules that require two feet of what's two, two feet of freeboard. So basically you have to build two feet above base flood elevation. All the buildings, uh, the transit center being the most obvious one uh, that have been built to these codes didn't flood. In fact, they didn't even get water within a foot of them. Uh, they are very safe if you can build. So you just elevate the building, put them at a higher elevation and you avoid a lot of the flooding. Um, so that's a lot of our approach is to now start working on elevating buildings. Now of those 300 buildings I was talking about that are in the floodplain, some of them only their basements are in the floodplain. Their first floors are above. So we have to work on how do we get things out of the basements. And we had, we have rules in place that required any damaged furnaces or utilities in the basement would have to be elevated to the first floor. And so we've had a hundred or so furnaces and electric panels all moved to the first floor. So if there's a flood again, all of those things in the basement won't be there to be damaged. They might have personal belongings there that get damaged, but the utilities are out. So that that's our approach is really to start working on flood proofing buildings. And uh, we have, that's what's in the budget adjustment act is a request for $2 million to the city. So we could elevate uh, 10, residential buildings that make up 20 housing units. Um, and that's that's in a different bill, but budget adjustment act. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the benefits of um, really good proactive planning and engaging citizens up front, um, in part to help avoid appeals. I guess I'm curious, how do you engage the citizens of Montpelier in your planning processes and um, how, I mean, if you're, you're, saying you, you're, you're saying you have really solid planning, I'm not questioning that, but you have a lot of appeals. Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, so most of our zoning is really set up to be as administrative as possible. So there's kind of two approaches to doing things. And um, you could talk to some planners who say, we should send a lot more projects through conditional use review because we're gonna notify the neighbors and everybody gets to have their say in your project. And that makes the process take longer, but um, also engages more of the public. We've taken the approach of being much more deliberate about making sure our rules accurately do what we want them to do and making as many of the permits administrative. So um, we are really trying to target, you know, you have to have this many what, what parking spaces or you've got to meet this, this or that requirement. If you meet those requirements, then you're gonna get your permit as opposed to sending it to your neighbors to get their opinion on whether uh, you should be allowed to have a duplex, let's say. But you're talking about the zoning not yeah. talking about the underlying planning that informs the zoning and how you engage the citizens in that so that they're not taken aback or surprised when their neighbor proposes to change the use adjacent to. So we do, uh, obviously, as we're working on our, our master plans, our city plans, we do engage, we do a lot of engagement. 
Uh, the city now has a communications coordinator, so we spend a lot of time working with her on how we can maximize our public output through Front Porch Forum and through Facebook and through a lot of different venues to try to get as much input as we can on the planning side. Country Club Road, for example, we hired, we spent $150,000, we hired a consulting firm to go through and handle the public input process. So that way the public didn't see this as the city driving this, you know, towards our goal as the city staff. It was really going to be, let's have a consultant run the public input process and bring back to city council and to staff. This is where the public, what the public would like to see up here. So we engage, especially in big projects that are city projects, we bring in the public and we bring them in early, right at the start. So that was the first step was before we even start working on these other pieces, let's get the planning piece done. Let's get the public's thought. Would they support um, large five-story buildings, which is actually what they, they proposed, five-story buildings in the lower part of Country Club Road. They felt it would, be, it would be good there. They didn't want any single family homes. So that's what the plan is laying out. And that's what we'll be going forward on, no single family homes, townhomes, condos, apartments, and large multifamily. Well, thank you so much for your testimony today. Okay. So if we're gonna welcome Kathy and LaRose, Colchester via Zoom. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> I will uh, start by introducing myself. Um, I don't think I have ever testified before, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Kathy Ann Rose. I am uh, have been a professional planner in Vermont uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, the first 15 or 16 of that, I was the city planner uh, in South Burlington. Um, and uh, I've been in Colchester now as the director of planning for the past three years or so. I've also worked as a private consultant, um, uh, helping some towns with uh, municipal plans. I worked uh, with the town of Middlesex on their last town plan update. Um, so I'm a little familiar with big town, small towns, urban and rural areas. Um, and now I'm newly familiar with um, on sewered areas. That's my new experience here in, in Colchester that I didn't have in South Burlington. Um, I've... Uh, read through uh, this bill in its entirety. I have also um, been following along um, with the necessary updates to Act 250 report, and I participated in that um, public presentation. I was grateful for that. I believe I provided just very minimal written comments on that when that was um, solicited. I didn't have too much to say then. Um, I don't have any written comments for you today. I haven't submitted any. Um, but I'm happy to sort of speak to you about, um, you know, sort of my role as a professional planner, as a municipal planner, um, especially as one who um, has uh, designations currently. Uh, the town of Colchester, um, as you may know, does have a growth center designation. We're one of only six in the state. Um, we've had that since, I believe, 2009. Um, and we are uh, actually renewing that this summer, hopefully. Um, we also have a new town center designation. So uh, that has, uh, you know, I think encouraged us to follow this bill in particular a little closely um, because I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how any new designations would interact or replace um, those designations, it's not entirely clear to me um, the intention just yet. I'm not sure if it's clear to you yet um, how that would work. So um, maybe like many people, as I read this, I end up with more questions than comments. Um, so in my role as a planner, you know, I, I'll share that I've never actually uh, completed an Act 250 application, but I've I've certainly seen them. I've heard from people. Um, I've heard from private developers and and nonprofits who who have done that. Um, I've also seen the effects um, of sort of you know the same effects that you that you hear about from from many people who um, who, who talk about that. And uh, you know the the number one thing that stands out to me um, in 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 all communities that I've seen is is that nine lot lollipop. Um, I thought that was a bit more unique 
um, in you know some larger towns, but I'm I'm seeing it everywhere, um, and and that's something that I continue to hope uh, we'll find a solution to someday. Um, I uh, they're very frustrating um, to professional planners because they are never good design. Nine lots, never good. Um, but that's that's as much of a soapbox as I'll get on there. Um, uh, again, reading the bill, I I have to agree with something that Mr. Miller said just a little bit earlier. Um, an overall approach of making the things that you want to have happen be easy um, and making the things that you don't want to have happen be difficult. Um, I sort of take this approach with my children as well. I think many of us probably have um, in a lot of our relationships and it's, it's common sense and I hope that it'll prevail. Uh, here as well. Um, and I hope that when, um, you know, the, the, the final version of, of whatever this is, is done, that uh, we make it very easy to have the smart planning and the growth areas that we want, that we all want, I think everybody wants, um, but it has to be easy um, or else it won't happen. And um, I'm not sure um, that we're there yet in making it easy. I do have some concerns with um, some of what I've read about it being easy. Um, but I think it's, you know, hopefully we'll get there. And um, I think that's that's all I have. But hopefully I can maybe answer some questions that'll help you guys um, maybe uh, achieve what you want out of um, any legislation that you can produce this year. All right, we have a question from Representative Sebelia. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, so I represent a number of smaller towns and I'm trying to understand uh, how they will uh, how they will comply and, and meet um, such historic legislation if we pass it. And so when you think about some of the proposals um, that are being uh, considered here, uh, that, that can you tell me um, the staff people that will be involved in Colchester in um, both compliance and um, community engagement? Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a very good question because Colchester is one of the largest communities in the state and we, we only have four staff members um, and, and it's gonna be challenging. We do our best, of course, um, and, and there are other departments other than just the planning department. Um, you know, so at least in Colchester, speaking for Colchester, we have a staff of four. You know, I'm, I'm the director, we have a, um, a zoning administrator and two other assistant zoning administrators. We have a lot of day-to-day -day permitting that has to get done um, per statute as well, every time somebody wants a deck or a shed. Um, and so that work has to get done. We have a timeline that's associated with that. And then we manage all of development review on top of that. Uh, we have a full-time um, development review planner who does that now. Um, and so when we talk about anything that's in uh say our growth center areas, um, you know, that that tends to be a team effort between myself as a, you know, sort of the principal planner and our um, our development planner. And then of course we work with other departments, everything from our department of public works, our town engineer, our emergency services to make sure that um, again, whatever is being built is something that is lasting and something that we can be proud of. And that um, is a safe space for people once it is built. And so when you said you only have four staff, that was in the planning department? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you, so there's there's a proposal here for um, creating exemptions, automatic exemptions for um, designated downtown designated areas <coughs> permanently. So do you think that would decrease workload for you, um, uh, getting that designation, increase workload for you? You know, I think, and again, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in this in this draft that's written. There are some things there I think that as as drafted would increase the workload. Um, I see things that that I flagged, you know, that require a public hearing if you hit 75 trip ends um, that require us to notify more people than we would now. Um, there are, you know, requires a town to administer existing Act 250 permits. Um, especially towns with no staff or one staff member, that is, uh, that's a big ask. Um, I think it's a big ask even for a larger town to administer um, existing Act 250 permits for criteria that they're not familiar with, 
Um, I've been a planner for 20 years. I'm not familiar with all of the criterion. Um, so those are some things that I noted um, that could come out of these designations, the tier 1A and, and 1B anyway, um, that would, I think, increase the workload for local planning offices. Earlier, um, you mentioned that you've worked with some smaller towns. Um, can you speak to how, I mean, what we're envisioning here is trying to support our smaller towns better in meeting their goals. Uh, and I guess I'm curious if you had enough experience working with smaller towns to be able to speak to how planning happens in them now, unstaffed smaller towns. Yeah, I think in, in some ways, um, some of the planning in small towns is um, some of the best planning I've seen because so many more of your community members get involved. Um, when I worked, you know, with with the folks in, in Middlesex, they had an incredible engagement process um, for their small town. They had more people come out ahead of their town plans, um, like actual numbers, not proportions, um, than I saw in a larger city. Um, so in some ways, you know, it's it's much better because, you know, people rise to the to the challenge and, and the community is more involved. Um, so from from that aspect, I think it works really well. Um, I, I can't say that I have a lot of data points, um, but um, it, it's impressive working with those towns. But they it is a lot of ask. And if you if you have a town where you don't have those incredible volunteers, um, that's where that's where you see the challenges. And, and many of these small towns have amazing volunteers. Um, but but they're going to tire out. I mean, they really do um, full time work and it does require for those volunteers, unfortunately, because there are so many hours, they tend to skew to a certain demographic because that dem they're the only demographic that has those hours. Uh, and while they're still amazing, um, you know, 100 percent of what you get tends to be people who um, who who are retired because they have the hours or um, their children are grown or um, they have a, a different income level. Um, so it's, it's definitely a challenge in the, in the small towns. Um, I can't say that I've worked with ones that, that haven't risen to it, but I'm sure they're out there. Do you, do you have any suggestions for how we could better support them? Oh, um, you know, I think you just continue to support your, your regional planning commissions and you continue to, um, make sure that the small towns, um, you know, that they know that they can rely on their regional planning commissions. Um, in Chittenden County, our regional planning commission functions very differently, I think, than the than the RPCs of, of different parts of the state. Um, one of my um, colleagues here um, came from the Central Vermont um, Planning uh, Regional Planning Commission. And when I speak with him, I, I learn a lot about, you know, the services that he provided in that area. Um, they do a lot of work. You know, he was on the road. Um, most nights of the week going from planning commission to planning commission. So, um, you know, it's a centralized service, um, but it's probably the most efficient way to support um, those small towns um, because you're you're not having to replicate that expertise over and over again. So I think just continuing to support those regional planning commissions, um, they're doing good work. Um, they're starting to, I know when I first started as a professional planner, the um, the regional planning commissions were sort of entry level. They still are to some extent. Um, they didn't really have the budgets um, to support skilled planners. Um, and so they were the first place you went out of college. Uh, you didn't have any expertise yet. You lasted two years, you turned over. Um, that was a challenge I think for a long time um, that I witnessed for regional planning commissions. Um, I think from what I understand, and I don't represent, you know, VAPTA in any way, um, I, I understand that that's gotten better, um, probably thanks to some funding. Uh, thank you guys for that. Um, so I think continuing to do that is probably the best way you can help those small towns. Thank you. Kathy and Ann. Sorry. Okay. We're getting an echo now from your audio, Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that change? Oh, no, it's changed. Yep, looks like it's done. Um, so uh, just a question uh, related to the RPCs, which I agree are really important tools for our communities. 
Would you rather be um, in an RPC that has uh, 50 towns or 15 towns? As an employee? No, as a town, depending on their services. Oh, gosh. Um, probably less, I think, um, just because, you know, RPCs really function, I think, as um, they function as staff in many ways. And having to learn, you know, all of those towns is challenging enough to add, to add volume to that, I think would be challenging. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today and for your testimony. Thank you. We're going to invite Ted Brady to join us. Um, and I wasn't clear, is it you or are you bringing folks or? It's me, aren't you lucky? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for the record, Ted Brady from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Uh, your chair is referencing the fact that on Friday I was asked to try to get a couple of uh, volunteer planning commission members to join me today. And we reached out to about a half dozen to a dozen folks. And uh, not surprisingly, they didn't feel uh, that they were ready to uh, study up on a hundred page bill and come in here and testify on just a couple of days notice. So I- I'm sorry if that is how the ask came across. We weren't necessarily asking them to do that. We wanted to just talk to planners and learn more about how they do their job. Excellent. So I can absolutely, I, I have a few people who are could tentative yeses Great. and uh, happy to invite them at your pleasure now hopefully with a few days and that they could come on via zoom and i think excited to do so okay that that's what we would need yeah represents really yeah just to put an even finer point on that you know we're like how could we improve some of our language or add to our bill in terms of thinking about the process i wanting to really just understand you know, that's what they're nervous about. <laughs> so I do want to, I, th I think you, I think we can get some people, it just takes us digging a little deeper to find those planning commission members who have been paying attention and are tracking this bill, the other two bills. I don't think they need to know the bill. I think, yeah, I don't think they need to know the bill. We need to understand what they're doing. But they do great. Uh, sorry for um, confusion on my part. Yeah, that's what I said. I think yeah. that the way it came up, it was we thoughts on the bill, but. So it's, we're good. We, we want to learn from them about how we can better support them. Representative. Thank you. Uh, do you have any towns or any planners from any communities that are opposed to this? Uh, or have you, are there any that have read it? Yeah. I think there are plenty that have concerns. I don't think anybody's opposed. That's the good news. I think we have a lot of towns that are concerned about provisions in this bill, as well as other uh, Act 250 change bills that are out there. And I want to be clear, right? I, I represent a lot of people and it's not a universal opinion. So I thought maybe I could start with defining where we do have agreement uh, and then maybe share some thoughts about the specific bill before, before us and then maybe get deeper. I loved, I loved the line of question, how do we help planning commission members do their job and exercise the uh, the charges that you have given them. I love that concept too. Is that okay with you? So uh, first let's, uh, Representative Smith, great cue up for me, right? We go through an elaborate process to try to come to universal consensus on issues. So the way we do that is every two years, we convene uh, about 50 to 75 municipal officials elected, appointed, and we, have them do a summer's worth of work and put together on paper some ideas that they believe uh, that VLCT should be championing for in this building. They then bring that idea to my board, which is made up of municipal officials. That board then brings that idea to the entire membership, which is every single city and town in the state. And every single city and town in the state has a chance to vote on that policy. And so the things I'm about to share are not my ideas. These are things that are universally accepted by the governance boards, right? By the legislative bodies of these places. So I know all of you could call any one of your towns and find somebody that disagrees with what I'm saying. I do recognize that, but all of their governing boards have agreed to what I'm about to say. And this is not specific to your bill. That's the good news. <laughs> uh, but the one like principle that relates to what we're doing here today is that they call for local discretion to pursue sustainable housing and economic development 
recovery and resiliency. And uh, I think the bill before you could do that, could actually get, get us there. I, I say could uh, because there are some things in there that do the opposite. I also say could and maybe should because last year the legislature took decisive action and told and preempted municipal decisions and told us that we have to do things differently to facilitate more housing growth. And I tried not to come in here and stand on my local control high horse and tried to say, I understand what you're doing. But in addition to that, you have to address the local, the, the statewide land use law, or it's all for not. You won't get anything out of it. you. The, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Losing, pre, losing the battle of preemption and telling municipalities what they have to do without telling the state to do something differently, in my mind, was wrong. And I really appreciate that all of you who told me, don't worry, we're going to get to this next year, that you're getting to it this year. So thank you. Uh, the things that specifically related to Act 250 that my membership, every city and town of Vermont have said, one, we want municipalities who have duly adopted local zoning and subdivision regulations to be able to accept responsibility to administer Act 250. I think the bill before you sort of does that, sort of, and that's an important piece. Two, we want to eliminate Act 250 jurisdiction over projects in designated downtowns, growth centers, new town centers, designated village centers, neighborhood development areas, and other areas designated in municipal plans. The bill kind of does that, right? So I really am trying to find that you guys are on the right track here, and I appreciate that. An area that's a little iffy right now is we have long argued for defining regional impact in Act 250 to mean a measurable effect on areas outside the borders of the city and town. This bill actually creates a new regional impact definition, which is, in our minds, the wrong standard. It's that 75 trips a day or something during rush hour. And it creates a new, uh, a less, a less, a smaller, a lower barrier. There we go. A lower barrier to uh, a re the definition of regional impact, which, again, going back to that local discretion to pursue things, the second you start calling more things regional, I'm, of course, going to have heartburn. Uh, eliminating district commissions review of projects to those with regional impact, another way of saying what I just said, uh, and uh, eliminating so-called legacy-only Act 250 jurisdiction over properties that would not otherwise trigger current Act 250 jurisdiction. I just want to say once again, I think your bill before you actually sort of does that, right? You delegate those Act 250 jurisdiction issues on existing permits to the municipal uh, bodies, which... Seems like a pretty artful solution, although I am sure many of those local AMPs are going to be nervous about enforcing the state's permitting requirements that they had no say over um, putting in place, right? So let me, um, I just want to ask about what is your definition of regional impact? What are, the, what are the things that we should be using if not trips per day, which I think the RPCs brought us last week? Um, What's a better trigger? What's a yeah. better way of quantifying those regional impacts that should warrant a regional review? Sure. So let's start with uh, the goal of, let me be direct on the answer in the question, actually. Uh, I think in a tier 1A place, I think it's going to be hard to find a regional impact because these are historically developed areas. And aside from building a airport or building a shopping mall, you know, a housing development of 25 or 50 units, I don't think should be defined as a regional impact. And under that definition, maybe it could be that 75. So I, I personally think there shouldn't be an, a regional impact in your tier 1A communities. When you get to tier 1B and beyond, uh, yeah, you're going to have a, a tighter threshold, right, for the definition of a regional impact. And I don't know what that should be. I don't know what the, the implications of 75 trips during peak hours are like i actually don't know what the implication there would be but it's my, my guess is it's pretty tight if you think about what it takes to get to 75 trips uh, sorry not to be more direct and give you the answer i'm happy to go back to my lawyers at vlct and try to come up with a better definition than all right so going back uh, so i should have told you what i was going to tell you in the beginning because then my next goal here after telling you what VLCT kind of broad policy agreements we have with the bill. I wanted to bring your attention to some things that I am actually concerned about. And that's that I think H687 plan growth area designation process doesn't 
recognize the historic and current municipal land use policies that we have in place. It doesn't adequately give deference to those the historic development that's occurred or the really thorough planning processes that are, are in place, land use decisions that are in place. Um, most of our cities and towns, as you've heard their RPCs say, have a really deep and thoughtful planning process that is largely in line with the state's uh, development goals because that's what the planning process requires, right? You have to have the town plan that mirrors your regional plan that mirrors the state plan. It's a pretty uh, thoughtful process. That process, just to remind you, you probably heard it from a few planning commissioners, goes through a rigorous local democratic process where a lot of people have a lot of say, right? Your planning commissioners that are citizen appointed, appointed citizens of your town, go through a process, go through public hearings, uh, open meetings to make a recommendation that then goes to the select board for adoption, where there's another open meeting where people can object. Then it, in many cases, in some cases in our rural communities, right, it then also goes to the town meeting. And that, you know, it's a, some of these planning and zoning policies are actually voted on at town meeting around the state. That process allows for a lot of input. The tier 1A plan growth designation requirements in the bill, exempting communities from Act 250 uh, jurisdiction, seem overly burdensome and out of reach of many Vermont municipalities' grasp, even though that process I just described happened in all those communities, right? So uh, this, the, my understanding of the summer study committees uh, that occurred um, didn't contemplate only exempting areas have capital budget programs, as is in Section D on page 48 of the bill, urban form bylaws, which is Section F on page 48, historic preservation bylaws, which is Section G on 48, municipal staff, which is Section J on page 49, or wildlife habitat bylaw reviews in alignment with the Fish and Wildlife Department on Section 8 on page 49. Perhaps the most, uh, the last one's the most and best example of an unnecessary and likely limiting requirement that's in this bill. If our goal, right, and efforts are to incentivize place-based jurisdiction, that's the whole, I think, the whole idea of this bill, right? Place-based jurisdiction means we are designating places where people can live. And we are designating, oh, I don't know, 95% or more of the rest of the state as places where it's going to be harder for them to develop. Then I don't believe that uh, the same old layering, the same old permitting requirements, and, and this is a really important one because a lot of this bill creates new appeals processes, creating new permitting and appeals processes that mirror. <laughs> it's not the goal. The goal was to say these places we want development in, and we recognize the towns have planning and zoning bylaws in place and planning and zoning processes in place. So let's say yes to development there. Creating an entire new process is going, it will, will not come to a better out, the same mirroring the process will not come to a better outcome. I'm also concerned that the tier 1B uh, may have structured, may be structured improperly to reach uh, other communities with historic development that would be appropriate for exemption. For example, tier 1B, which is most of the towns that have historic settlement, right? Tier 1A seems to be your downtowns and maybe a few other places, regional uh, county seats. Tier 1B, now, you know, there aren't many there aren't many benefits in in tier one B by the way if I read it correctly just the fifty units of housing and to get there you need to have professional staff which you know that's not a common uh, thing in our tiny towns uh, and uh, the language uh, requires that they have adequate planning and zoning uh, sorry that's I shouldn't have brought my eyes up the staff issue ultimately in my opinion in tier one B is if municipalities have adopted town plans and bylaws. Uh, they should be that should be more than enough to qualify for one B. I want to pause there. I have a couple more things on RPC relationships, um, but I want to pause there because I've just been talking at you and that's not effective. So, <laughs> well, I, I have a somewhat. I, I have a question. I'm curious. I think there's about 94 towns that are currently one acre towns. How do you work with them? What do you know about them? Why are they one acre towns? Yeah, so let's see, how do we work with them? The most common thing that we work on planning and zoning issues is that we have four attorneys at VLCT that uh, anybody, any municipal official can call and ask a question. And so planning commission members from those towns, select board members from those towns will frequently call us and ask us, hey, can we do this? How do we do that? And we'll give them confidential legal advice that 
uh, answers that question, hopefully, or unfortunately, there are plenty of times where we have to say you have to go talk to your uh, municipal lawyer. The other way we interact with those towns is every year uh, in the spring, trying to line up with when new planning commission appointments might be made. Uh, we hold a two part planning and zoning training where we go over the roles and responsibilities of the planning commission. And we usually have like 100 to 150 people attend these trainings. Um, and we do, uh, in addition to that, we give them an overview of the laws that you've changed in that last year. So those are the two ways that we're pr primarily working with those towns. So I guess I'm, do you have any insight as to why 50 years later, 50 plus years later, they remain one acre town? I, I don't have insight. I, I think uh, if you'd like, I can try to bring a couple of those <clears throat> communities to the table. I mean, there's, yeah, okay. yeah. So it seems like a lot of your members would be those folks. And I guess I'm wondering how engaged they are in your planning process for your setting your priorities and how do you make sure that when you reach out to communities, it's not just the larger communities? Yeah, I, I think if you look at our board, uh, our board has people from communities of thousands to you know, communities of 20,000. And when you look at our municipal policy uh, folks uh, on the, those summer committees I mentioned, we intentionally make sure the tiniest towns are represented. And uh, if you look at the league, uh, this is a dirty secret of the league. The larger members pay the largest dues and the smallest members use us the most. Uh, because the smaller ones are the ones that call us the most. So I, I don't think that's a concern on our part. The smaller ones are the ones that need the most help. So they're using us the most. Other questions, members? Um, Representative Bongar. I wanted to explore with you a little bit. I think you alluded to the, the um, person who was here from Montpelier. I, I, I think you said the same thing. But this notion of if we give exemptions to the 1A towns so for the areas within... <laughs> It's out to be. In that area, there will be some existing active fifty permits, and the way that I think we're thinking about it is that rather than still have somebody from the active fifty area that trying to enforce those permits, we would turn over enforcement to the municipalities uh, through their, um, I guess, the zoning board, um, and. I think we had one comment that we're not equipped to take that on, and yet um, you can't just erase them because, in many instances, they were negotiated, uh, you know, to make it work, and the neighbors are happy with it. They reached a settlement, and they deserve still to have those parameters that were set by the process. So, any ideas? Because yeah. Yeah. we were trying to, I think, in, in this bill, we were trying to like say. No, okay, we, we want to stay the state out of this and let the have the towns enforce it. Got a little pushback a minute ago on that. So Yeah, so what I think it's a, actually a pretty artful idea, as I said. I think some towns are gonna say, yes, I'd like to do that. And so perhaps that's the solution, which is you can delegate that out to communities that want it. I think there are also a lot, as the bill contemplates, there are some conditions that can be retired. And it would be fully appropriate to retire those. And uh, the last thing is, if you gave municipalities the authority, perhaps change them also. <laughs> uh, maybe that uh, that allays some of those concerns. There are towns that aren't going to have the ability, though, to manage an Act 250 permit condition from 20 years ago when they have just a volunteer planning commission and a part-time zoning administrator. I, I don't know how often that's going to happen because how many of those Tier 1A and Tier 1B towns don't have that infrastructure, not many. <clears throat> We're probably talking about A's in there, but so your suggestion would be to allow towns to opt in or out of, yep. of taking on enforcement, and if they opt in to allow them to change the conditions. Yep. Okay. So uh... The one A towns, and I have asked this question before. I don't, I'm assuming you are going to have this information, the LCT. Tier one towns, I think I've heard reference of. We expect that'll be about 23 towns. Is there a list somewhere of what those towns of those towns? We haven't created a list. We looked at it, and this is one of 
So my largest concern about the entire bill is you're trying to codify everything right into the bill to say, this is what exactly what we mean. And ultimately we don't have the maps. Uh, we don't, we haven't gone through that process yet. So we don't really know what it means. And I think there may be an opportunity to give more deference to the newly created environmentally environmental review board to do some rulemaking or something along that to get there. Cause I, I actually don't think I could answer that question. Now, I don't know. I assume based on what I read and the requirements that it's just our designated downtowns. Uh, but I don't know if our designated downtowns have all adopted, you know, form based code or if they've all adopted um, wildlife corridor things. I think I heard earlier today that some of this was taken from the uh, downtown designation program, but not all of it, right? So I don't know if the, one of the new layers that was added takes some of the downtowns out. What a long answer. I should have just said, I don't know. That's good. <clears throat> oh, that's, appreciate your answer. Um, so rather than trying to codify everything all at once, do you have any thoughts on kind of- uh, in Yeah. How to Absolutely. Codification? Well, uh, I think the best way is to give the, body that you establish more deference in establishing the rule and, and go through a rulemaking process that would also be much a, a little more democratic in that you'd have municipalities from around the state able to weigh in uh, outside of, you know, four months in this building. Uh, you'd have potentially uh, more science and data on your side through a professional board that's, you know, going through a process, conferring with other entities. But I don't say for all. I mean, I know you have to put some definition out there, but this is the definition you have is pretty deep in my mind for tier 1A. When these are places that we want development to occur in, why are we creating a duplicative permitting process that has just as many opportunities for people to appeal, just as many opportunities to say no as there are to say yes? So do you feel similarly about uh, definitions for tier 3? No, so I... I listen, I have plenty of members and I didn't bring with you, the, you know, the, the comments that are saying we want to preserve our, our our sensitive areas. We have comments like that, too. And so I'm trying to stay away from tier three uh, today because I, I'm not a substantive expert. on saying, what are we going to say yes to? But I, I do want to point out there are plenty of opportunities in that tier three uh, to. Uh, mistakenly and unknowingly hamstring the ability of our smallest towns have any growth occur. And that's one of the things I hope our universal goal is every town in Vermont should have an opportunity to grow. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about these tiers, and I appreciate that you're trying not to wade into the muck on tier three. When you're thinking about these tiers and you know we're thinking about you know whether or not this is something we're gonna define here, present to Vermonters, um, do you have any advice for us in terms of this kind of large scale um, uh, designation um, of Act 250 in terms of how to engage with communities on this? Uh, yeah. I, I think that the statement I just made is the goal should be for every town in Vermont to have a place that, where they can grow. Uh, in municipal planning and zoning, the whole purpose of municipal planning and zoning is to balance the individual property rights with the community good, right? And uh, that, I think, recognizing that that's occurring in these smaller towns is important. Now, just because they're one acre towns doesn't mean they've given up all hope of having, you know, a, a implication, a uh, impact or having an impact on what their town looks like going forward. I'm not answering your question. Representative Celia, but I do understand it, and I'll try to put some more thought to it. I don't think that one could assume anything about these approximately 94 towns that have stayed one acre. I think some of them prefer to Act 250 oversee larger developments in their town, and that that they care a lot. I'm not saying I don't think it's a comment on whether they care or not about their town. I think it's well, I don't know because we don't know, but I, I have a lot of thoughts on potential reasons why we've heard from some why but not that many 
Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'm literally and figuratively scratching my head. Um, uh, I find that statement, the goal should be to allow every town to grow, I, a curious one. I, you know, we haven't talked about that as a committee, but I would say a large percentage of the energy in this building right now is trying to figure out um, costs to support education. And, you know, as someone from a the largest community of the state, um, you know, I sometimes wonder, like, at what point can we, as a as a community of 650,000 people, make sure everybody has mm -hmm. everything the way they want within a finite budget? And so I guess I just want to push that a little bit more because it is that, I mean, you're the executive director of BLCT, so you can say, yes, that's my goal. That's fair. But I guess just to the committee, I, I don't know that that is a sustainable path forward, that if you have a town with 100 people in it, that no matter what, we're going to try and keep that town going. I don't, I don't know that that's sustainable. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying I, I'm not sure it is. Yeah, and I would bet that uh, in some of those smaller towns, there's going to be a debate about whether they want to grow also. And that's what I'm really saying is every town should have that ability to have that debate. And if they debate and say, yes, we want to have some, you know, new housing built in our community, they should be able to say yes, because you've all recognized, we've all recognized that they have a place in their town that uh, is the least environmentally sensitive based on our maps uh, and they could grow there. But I feel like that town should be able to say yes or no to that. I understand what you're saying, that, you're, but ultimately the concept of, uh, you know, democracy in this local democratic process should allow a town to say, I want this or I don't want this. And, and, and I guess I, just as a follow up, I don't know that the bill right now is saying they can't do that, but it seems like you're interpreting the current draft 2.1 as potentially saying that. Yeah. I mean, so I, I proceed going back to tier three and the uh, environmentally sensitive areas and critical areas. I think telling a town, if a town ends up having, you know, a lot of tier three in it and almost zero, if any, tier 1A that could happen, which is most, uh, those towns should have a chance at 1B or something that says we can grow here. Even though most of our town is in, you know, in a critical area, this area here we can say yes to. I also think you can't just say yes to the downtowns, the flooding and river issues. Some of the areas we say yes to need to be higher, right? And that might not be the most environmentally sense. Uh, uh, it may be an environmentally sensitive area, but a small portion of that may we may need to say yes in too. I hear your question about scale and concern, and I, I just want to go back to the democratic process should determine where we grow and where we don't within the confines of all these other things that we're going to layer on. Thanks. Can we talk about RPCs briefly? <laughs> So regional planning commissions are like the lifeblood of municipal government right now. They are keeping us alive. Uh, they are our partners. They provide the technical assistance. I am nervous that what you have before you will redefine that relationship in a way that will harm the relationship. Uh, and so let me just give you a couple examples. I'll, I'll try to cite them. Uh, on page 50, line 11, subsection 3, uh, the bill allows regional planning commissions to approve or deny an application for planned growth area of a, in a, for a municipality. I think this is on 2.1, version 2.1, page 50, line 11, subsection 3. Uh, I don't believe the RPC currently has any yes or no approval authority with a municipality. That's a big change and one that will change the way municipalities and RPCs relate. I don't actually, actually exactly know how but I know it will change it. Uh, there's also on page 53, uh, the bill gives regional planning commissions a uh, party status to appeal. Uh, I don't, going back to what we talked about projects of regional significance, you have seen some RPCs are extremely active and define almost every project in their community to be a regional project. And they weigh in on every single Act 250 application in their jurisdiction. That's not appropriate in my other, act, other RPCs have sued towns and won because 
the law has been interpreted to say they get to do that. I don't think that's appropriate either. That's the point that you folks obviously have to decide on. But giving them another opportunity here to wedge between uh, the municipality and the RPC, I don't think is going to create a healthy relationship. <clears throat> on page 63, uh, the bill gives regional planning commission substantial deference in municipal regulatory proceedings. I just want everybody to understand like significant uh, substantial deference in a municipal plan. So, so somebody is going to tell the towns now what they can and can't do that couldn't do that before. <clears throat> On page 67, municipalities lose the right to appeal, uh, sorry, lose the right to veto a regional plan. So you, I, I'm sorry to dictate, uh, to read what's in your bill again. Uh, I'm not just trying to show you I did my homework, I promise. This is kind of a big deal too. I mean, right now, uh, you know, the RPC's boards, which are made up of municipal appointments, right, approve the plan, and then the, the municipalities have this right to veto it for so many days. It takes it away. So municipalities are losing the ability to weigh in on, uh, an opportunity to weigh in on a plan. Those are just a few of those things in there that are changing the relationship. Can we just rewind to that one for a second? Yeah. Because, um all of the towns have a member on the board of the regional planning commission so when you say they current a town currently has the right to veto a regional plan or their support of it is that what you mean their support of it no i think they can veto the plan because the the, the person acting on behalf of the town at the rpc doesn't need a, a vote of the select board to act right they get to vote yes or no based on their own opinion and I think the current law intentionally gives the select boards an opportunity to weigh in as a board, because a select board member, unlike that person sitting in the RPC, has no power on their own. Like a select board member is nothing without their two or four friends that they sit down with every other Monday, right? So it gives that board a chance to say, we actually don't agree with the decision that person made. Uh, and it's the democratic process then weighing in. I don't think it happens. I, I don't. I'm not unaware of it happening in my state. I've never heard of that. I mean, we'll we'll have to look into that one. All of these things are just the RPCs are going to play a very big policy role here. And I want to be clear. I'm uncomfortable with giving them all of that policy control, but I see why we have to. Like if for the greater good, we are we are sacrificing some municipal control so that we can get something in the end, which is more control over development where we want it, right? So I, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't do any of this, but that's a lot. And that's that's a big change in the relationship. Yeah. Ted, you just said um, something we want is more control over development in areas that we want it. I think you want less control. The towns want more control, though, to be able to say this is where we want it. So the whole idea, right, is because we have made decisions as towns through the local planning and zoning process to say we want development in these historically settled areas, we don't think the state should be saying no to us. So that's what I mean by we want more control. The town wants to be able to say this is where we want development to More have. local control, less state control. My last comment, I'm sorry I've taken so long, is uh, the current bill doesn't include immediate relief in the midst of a housing crisis. I want to remind, I'd like to share my trauma with all of you from last year. When uh, Act 47 passed, uh, most of Act 47 was supposed to be implemented one or two years in the future. And on the last day of the session, without anybody calling VLCT or a single town, the legislature decided, we're going to make everything in this bill effective July 1st. Because it's a crisis. This bill does nothing for three years. You know, I shouldn't say that. I apologize. This bill does not make a change in on the ground land use policy for three years until 2027. And so my recommendation, because I recognize you can't just uh, wave a wand, is that you extend the Act 250 changes you made in Act 47 until 2027 or when this is implemented. And you give municipalities some deference and say our designated areas, designated downtowns, village centers uh, are exempt from Act 250 period until this is uh, put into place. 
So that's it. I thank you for the time. Appreciate you putting up with me. Any other questions? Representative Bongard. The, the uh, exemptions that we did last year in S100 run for three years. So they're still in effect and they will be. So that would take us to 2026, right? Well, through 26, right? Because they took effect well, until the mid 20s. Yeah, they started July 1 of 24. So they go to July 1 of 27. I share my skepticism about this being done by January of 2027. That, that's one of the things that we all have in our heads is that those exemptions are in place and they coordinate it. So I, I get your point. I just want to note, note that they for three we have a couple more years. So noted your skepticism about July 1, getting this done by July 1, 2027. What do you think is the hardest part of getting this done, this done by July 1, 2027? Uh, so I think the maps are going to be harder than... Uh, than we all would like them to be, right? Uh, I think a process by which those maps, that, that all the municipalities get to weigh in those maps is going to be hard. Uh, and then I also think the way the bill is structured now, it's going to take the Environmental Review Board years to start approving Tier 1A and Tier 1B down. So it could be 2028, 2029, 2030 before, you know, a substantial number of those downtowns are approved. I've seen government systems take longer than they should. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. Uh, one more question? Yeah, Representative Lowry. Will we um, get a copy of your testimony? Yes, I will email it right after this conversation to Will. Thanks again. All right, members, so we're going to take a 10 minute break. All right, we're going to reconvene our afternoon hearing and Continue take, talk, taking testimony on H687. I'm going to welcome Brian Shoup. Great. Thank you, Brian Shoup. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, and just for the record, Jamie Fidel, our forest and wildlife program director, is here today. We were both listed as witnesses. We weren't quite sure how we were going to sort things out, but um, he's available as well for questions or whatnot if needed. Um, so I was asked to talk about the so-called road rule. Um, which was a jurisdictional in Act 250 for several decades. Um, what it was is the construction of any new road, and that included the upgrade of a Class 4 road, triggered Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, a road was defined as having um, serving three or more uh, houses or lots. Um, it was repealed in 2001 as part of a package of changes when the so-called 10-acre loophole was repealed. And what that was was... Um, uh, prior to that, any lot could be created without a, an approved septic system if it was 10 acres or more. So there's a package of kind of Act 250 and other regulatory changes in 2001 that, that um, resulted in the repeal of the road rule. I was not at Act 250 at the time. Or, I'm sorry, at VNRC at the time. I believe that we opposed it. Um, but other folks did support it because it was considered by many to be a flawed uh, jurisdictional trigger. And it was flawed in that... Um, it, it could result in the construction of two 790 foot roads on the same property or a 790 foot road that had extensive driveways going off in all directions that would have the same fragmenting impact of a, of a longer road. Um, so it did result in some kind of strange subdivision design. Um, and, and many folks in the planning community felt that um, better jurisdictional triggers were needed. Um, Interest in reestablishing it has arose several years ago, largely uh, kind of at the same time that the legislature was getting more aware of forest fragmentation issues and the loss of our forest lands in the state, and as well as other resource lands like farmland. Um, and um, as a result of that kind of greater awareness, the House has passed a forest fragmentation criteria of Act 250 three different times in 2017, 2020, and 2022. Um, and we view the road rule or some other jurisdictional trigger in rural areas and in our forested areas as being a, an important companion with a forest fragmentation criteria. Um, and, and I think Jamie uh, has been in here earlier this year talking about forest fragmentation, the trends that are happening in the landscape and why action is needed in Act 250 and, in, and other policies. Um, so the Commission on the Future of Act 250 
issued its report in 2019, and they had gone through a pretty extensive uh, public process and a stakeholder process and came up with a, a whole host of recommendations, many of which have been included in legislation passed out of this committee in the past, um, most noteworthy in uh, uh, 2020. Um, and they didn't have specific jurisdictional triggers, but the commission did say that we needed better rural jurisdictional triggers in order to address things like forest fragmentation and the loss of other resources. So when the, this commission followed up on the commission's work in 2020, um, and I'm trying to remember that, that uh, H, uh, when you passed um, uh, H926, that had a, a variation of the original road rule in it. And what it was was a 2,000 foot cumulative road rule. And by cumulative, I mean um, it included not only multiple roads in a project or on a parcel, but the driveways associated with them. And I, I think you're planning on hearing some testimony tomorrow on headwater areas and really. One of the issues that's probably most important to us, in addition to forest fragmentation, is when you have extensive roads and driveways and upland areas on steep slopes, you change the hydrology and you need to be careful about how you're engineering the property. And most municipalities that I'm aware of, and I've written a lot of zoning in this state, don't have very sophisticated or, if at all, stormwater regulations and erosion control regulations in their zoning. Act 250 is very good at bringing state resources into the review process for those types of, of developments. So, um, again, in 2020, um, uh, you passed 926, which included the 2,000 foot cumulative road rule. And as I mentioned, it, it differed from the original road rule that it included all of the roads um, and, and driveways. So, VNRC supported that policy at the time and we've advocated for it ever since. Uh, the NRB has issued their report uh, a couple of months ago. They included a consensus recommendation that there be a 2,000 foot road rule. Um, and I think the reason there was such buy-in from diverse stakeholders, including housing folks and the administration, um, was that it would likely result not necessarily in a lot more Act 250 reviews, but in how a uh, changes in how developers configure their properties through site design and clustering to try to avoid jurisdiction by minimizing road and driveway length, which we consider to be a, a good strategy, a good policy to um, address forest fragmentation. So it's, it would both capture more development in the Act 250 process by having a new jurisdictional criteria, but it would also um, uh, result in on the ground changes in how projects are designed. And we think that's a positive. Um, So I did share with Will um, a variation of the um, 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 road rule that was passed in, in 2020. Uh, 2020. Um, and the changes that we would recommend for it, um, it did a couple of things. And um, one, it dealt with all roads and driveways cumulatively. We felt as though there should be a trigger for a single road in addition to the cumulative road and driveway trigger. And that was not a consensus decision, so that's not a recommendation of the NRB. We argued for it, we advocated for it, we ex let people know that we'd continue to do that. So the draft that I provided adds a new provision that would um, include an 800 foot single road in addition to the cumulative road and driveway uh, construction on, on the property. Um, another thing that in 2020 it did is it looked at um, kind of looking at the extension of roads over time for a 10 year period. So if you built, you know, 800, a uh, uh, thousand foot of driveway, and then next year, another 500, and then the next year, another 800, at some point you're gonna get to 2000, but this, this expired that after 10 years. So after 10 years, you basically started over again, 2000 foot into the forest or 800 feet into the forest. We would suggest that you just, start from day one and continue. And at some point you're gonna hit that trigger if you continue to encroach into the into the forest. So eliminate that 10 year expiration date. Um, so th those are the two recommended changes and we provided that, that uh, draft language to you. Um, I'm sure there's other ways to do it. There's improvements for it. We're not uh, beholden to that language by any stretch, I think as the committee works through 
different ideas, it would be, there's probably room for improvement. We just wanted to kind of update where you were with where we would suggest that you, <clears throat> the direction you head in now. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. I, it's not extensive policy. This is something that's been uh, before the committee before. It's been before um, Senate committees before. It was in place for a couple of decades in a different variation. Um, and it's not the only jurisdictional trigger that would work to combine with a good force fragmentation criteria. Um, I, I do want to uh, emphasize with regard to the force fragmentation criteria, and I believe um, uh, uh, NRB Chair Haskell mentioned that there is currently no functional force health force fragmentation criteria. There's no criterion Act 250 that really gets at the issues that are happening in our force today. And that's really critical. And as I believe Jamie Fidel has testified before, such a small percentage of residential development of the large lot scattered residential subdivisions that are occurring come under Act 250 today, it's really important to have a different jurisdictional trigger, a new jurisdictional trigger to bring more of that in, into, um, into uh, under review. Members have questions. Yeah, I'll ask, we, we saw um, some examples I think even a couple of them from, from Jamie, of roads just going straight up into the forest, uh, 2,000 feet or, and I guess I just keep thinking about that, some of those images, and that's a hell of a distance into mm -hmm. the forest. Um, and so how does what you're talking about help with not let that happen. I get the 800 feet for one, but then just put on two when you, you're there effectively. So how do we stop that? <clears throat> um, you know, we're supporting something that, that was a, had a lot of other political support. Um, and it's, there's no criteria is perfect. You could have universal jurisdiction. You could have a shorter length. Um, you could do a lot of different things. Um, you know, we're, we're have been advocating for this since 2020. We felt as though it was meaningful that there was uh, uh, a strong recommendation in the NRV study, but it's not perfect. So just to, if I, sure, I think one of the things you suggested is that this would tend to result in cluster development. Um, and I guess the theory would, for that would be that the developer would want to conserve road length yes. so judiciously in order to get more houses. So that's one of the, is that one of the theories on which you're suggesting? And I, and I do believe that would be the case. And there, there are a, a few towns that have a road trigger for conditional use review under the zoning. Um, and I, I, I believe that's been the case in those towns, but I'm not going to, I would want to, I would want to come back and confirm that. I don't want to put that on the record. Can you get us the names of those towns? And it may be great to get their, look at their zoning. Yeah, it's, we worked with, uh, we've, we've done some work with communities and uh, we worked with both Enosburg and Montgomery on um, habitat protection and forest, uh, forest conservation. And I know one or both of those did that. I, I, will, I will get that to you. Senator Smith. Thank you. I feel like I'm repeating myself over and over, but not necessarily with you, but with anybody that's sitting there. Uh, Representative Bongars mentioned something about 2,000 foot roads. Well, how do you stop these roads from being built into large expanses of woods when you can't even stop the state of Vermont from building one that's 5,000 feet um, in the hurricane. I'm not familiar with what I'm, you're I'm sure, I, I didn't think you were, and I, I, I don't mean to sound offensive over it, but I haven't been able to get any good answers from anyone. So I just thought I'd let you look into it if you want. Uh, this road goes probably 5,000 feet up into the woods and stops and goes nowhere. The, the reason being was 
They want to let people get back into the woods a little bit. Well, you want to get back in the woods, you park by the road and walk in. I would agree with you. And I don't know how we can stop anybody from building a road if the state of Vermont can do whatever they want. Well, um, you can bring state and municipal projects, including road construction, under Act 250 jurisdiction. So I, I believe that the um, 2020 language may have exempted municipal and state road construction, but I think uh, I, that would be a great suggestion that you're making that we include that new construction of state and municipal roads. In your spare time, just take a look at that. Look at that map in the hurricane. It's under, it was built under the auspices of uh, it being an existing logging road. Well, it was a path that they used for pulling wood out of the woods when the ground was frozen 50 or 60 years ago. Now there's four feet of gravel, and if they want to blacktop it, anybody could drive up in there. It's ready for blacktop. So take a look at it. I'd like to hear your opinion of it later on. The, um, the historic road rule uh, exempted uh, farm and forest, you know, forestry roads, but if they were converted to development, it triggered jurisdiction. I think they're probably trying to say that it was a historic road, but but anyway, thank you. I just wanted to share that with you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> you know, I have concerns about already built private roads, and I guess I feel like there's a, a lot of them already there. Um, and I'm curious if anyone's tracking the existing road densities across our landscape or um, what your knowledge of those are? Um, I know that when Jamie presented some mapping, we looked at public and private roads related to E91 points, most of which are single family homes. The, the reality is um, you're absolutely right. There are um, very few new public roads being built in, um, except in South Burlington and Williston and uh, Essex, in those communities, if a private developer wants to come in and build a subdivision, they have to build the road to the town specifications, indeed that town, those roads over to the town. That rarely happens in rural Vermont. Um, I, I was on our DRB for many, many years. We approved a lot of subdivisions and they all had private roads. Um, I'm on the select board now and we don't want to take over any more roads. We plow all the roads that we, that, that we want to plow. I mean, that's pretty much the case across the state. New development is almost always served by private roads. Um, so, so in that way, I think that the road rule would be a, a meaningful policy to bring in and make sure that these roads are designed properly, they're located properly, and that the, you know, the associated developments not having you know, in a critical wildlife area. I think the question you're raising, though, is what do we do about those existing roads? Um, I remember when... Uh, Act 62, the water quality bill was passed. That brought municipal roads under um, water quality jurisdiction for a general permit to have to deal with runoff and sedimentation. We were advocating that you needed to apply that to private roads as well, but that didn't, didn't go anywhere. Um, I know that um, Andrea Morganti is going to be testifying, I believe, tomorrow, and she has a lot of experience over her close to 30 years on the Heinsberg Select Board with private road development. Um, and I, I think that, you know, um, Representative Von Gartz, in a, don't mind, in a side conversation, mentioned, how do you trigger the new road construction? Do you trigger it uh, as if a private road is extended? Do you measure from where it meets the public road or from where the existing private road is? That's a great topic to, to talk about. I haven't thought a lot about that, and maybe that's a way that you bring in the existing roads and make sure that any necessary kind of remediation for water quality or whatever is, is addressed at that time. That was a little rambly, but is that clear? I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess I, um, the cost of not just private, but town roads up in our higher elevations, our headwaters, near our headwater streams has certainly become front and center most our last summer and now December, um, and how we collectively manage um, that is increasingly front and center on my mind. Just I think the costs of that 
both the dollar cost and then the impacts of flooding downstream that can occur because of them. Um, and I guess if there's folks out there who are studying that, I would love to find them. You know, it's we've, we've done a lot of um, research and documentation of subdivision trends, and it's a lot of work and nobody is tracking on a town by town basis. I mean, that's the reality of having most of our land use decisions being made by municipalities. There's no central bank, you know, um, and, the, and then the, the level of review varies greatly from municipality to municipality. Um, and the level of record keeping varies. So um, it would be an interesting question for someone like John Adams, uh, who does GIS mapping and private roads are a, a you know, a, a map GIS feature. Um, I don't know if they can kind of date them to show trends of, of how they're developing over time, but that would be an interesting question for them. Um, and we've actually been doing a little bit more GIS mapping develops so a little bit more capacity lately. So I, I, I think I'm going to look into that as well. That'd be great. Do members have further questions? Great. Representative Tori. Thank you. Um, so private roads for sure, where I live. I even live on one. Um, the other trend. So do I. <laughs> and it's not easy to manage. Um, the other trend that I'm seeing is um, when these high elevation homes are put in, is a lot of clearing. Um, would, would that get addressed if more of that development was under Act 250 um, because yes. of habitat and the other criteria that would- I mean, in, in most instances, you're gonna have not just a road construction, but an associated subdivision. It's gonna, I think the, that 2000 foot road to a single house is gonna be unusual, but in this, market that's not you know unheard of by any stretch but i think mostly it's subdivisions and they would and they would look at the impact of the entire subdivision um or whatever you know development is being served by that road or driveway so yeah that's that impact and especially if we had a forest fragmentation criteria which does look at siting and mitigation and impacts on habitat and, and other resources Members, any further questions? I'm not seeing any. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for your testimony. Thanks for, uh, for having us in. Is this an early afternoon for you now? <laughs> okay. Okay. Not early. Yeah. Oh. Three hours. That was pretty good go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, members, um, we will adjourn for the afternoon. We did actually let me just <clears throat> quick budget check in letter and um, we just need to find your timing for when we can talk about budget issue. Sense of that? Uh, well, they're only next hearing, week. yeah, I think it's next week or the week after. I could follow up someone in the probes. They're only hearing from the public service department this week. So, um, you know, for a comprehensive letter from us, um, I don't, I don't think, I mean, definitely not this week. Um, with regards to ANR, I've not started on anything related to the letter. Um, if, if it's helpful for folks, I can start to flush out something. Um, but I figured, unlike last year, where we did actually all listen to, to some of the feedback, I, I didn't want to presume and start drafting something based off of what I had just heard. So well, I guess we haven't heard from commissioners. Do members want to hear more digging in from three commissioners? We heard from the secretary last week. Representative Sevilla. Yeah, I'd like to hear from DPS agent and PUC. Yeah, yeah. budgets. Okay. Oh. Uh, DEC seems important given how much we've talked about water quality and how 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 much we've talked about waste management and toxics. I don't know. It seems like it would be um, perhaps helpful to find out how all those various funds, those special funds, are actually holding up or not. Do you have their charts from Representative Squirrel that you could? email to the committee and share with us. 
Yeah, I I will share what I have. I'm not sure. It's not quite as pithy as the BAA. The BAA that Rep Squirrel was able to share last time around, you know, it fits on like three pages, whereas this time it's like the long. So I will share. He had, when he came in, he had the, the graphic. Oh, yeah, I can, just, I can, yep. I, think was our I can find that, yep. To look at before we hear and then get our heads into it and then be able to ask questions. Yeah, I can find that. That'd be great. Representative Clifford. Um, I'm thinking maybe hear more from, uh, um, from uh, Commissioner Herrick, uh, specifically on that fish hatchery issue, and you know, whether or not anything can be saved out of that or not. I don't know. Still get some 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 letters about that too. So. Yeah. Yes. Representative Pat. Oh, yes. It was information I attended the um, uh, testimony from the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC, at the Appropriation Committee at late morning today. Uh, it was pretty, pretty brief, and I, I'm just going to say, in overview, um, uh, there's not a whole lot going on there. I mean, they they're funded pretty much entirely by a, a special fund by a dedicated gross gross receipts tax. And there was one one issue that Representative Dolan, who's a member of the committee, had had raised and and uh, texted us about, which is that there there were three positions that were temporary positions that were created by the Global Warming Solutions Act, I believe, that are not budgeted uh, anymore. And the answer to that that I want to look in more is that given the timing of things, there is no program now for them to, there, there, may, there may be in the future, but there isn't one going into this fiscal year. And I need to look into that to understand it a little better. But other than that, um, uh, I think that the, the department's um, uh, budget, which is the Department of Public Service, and they'll be in on Thursday, uh, is a bigger budget, uh, more people, and more uh, uh, program staff that I think will be probably of, of greater concern in terms of our review of it. Just my first impression. Mr. Smith. I thought I heard Paul talking about uh, Shrewsbury. Did I hear that? Salisbury. Salisbury. Yeah. yeah, the fish and fish hatchery. Yeah. I, I heard some stuff today about some of the budgeting that's been going on with that, and it didn't sound like it's above board. And I'd like to, I would like to hear Chris from Ed, hear more about it, because how can, how can a property that's owned by the state of Vermont all $12 million in disrepair? That doesn't happen. So there's something, there's something fishy there, so to speak. Well, it, like it wasn't, it's, I don't think it's, like, how you consider disrepair, but it's the permitting that they have to have the special permit for when the discharge into the river. Well, from what I understand, the discharging that's going into the river is way under what state specs are. And I don't know. Oh, that's that's what I understood today. I could be wrong. I doubt it. <laughs> it's your birthday. How can you be wrong? I, I can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow's coming. Yeah. Tomorrow's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and only 365 <laughs> days, I'll be 74. All right, members, with that, we'll adjourn and see you in the morning. <laughs>